Most people don't understand that the truth is, is that every time you overcome yourself a little bit more, the side effect is that you love yourself a little bit more. It's not about your wealth. It's not about your health. It's not about your freedom. It's who you become. What actions, what behaviors do you want to change? Do you complain? Do you blame? Do you judge? Do you make excuses? How do you talk? Do you speak limited? Just pick four things that you're not going to do any longer. What emotions get you in trouble? And if you don't know, close your eyes for about 30 minutes and just watch where your mind goes and watch your feelings and just say, okay, it's frustration, it's unworthiness, it's self-doubt, it's guilt, it's frustration, it's shame. Just become conscious of those and just review them in your mind. You know, people say, oh, well, you shouldn't focus on the negative. Well, really? That's 95% of who you are. And you got to begin to dismantle or denature that old personality. Mm -hmm. And that means you're going to have to come up against the cravings that the body has emotionally. You know, like it's, it's eight o'clock in the morning and you're doing your meditation. You're normally in traffic and mm -hmm. you want to get angry and your body's going, hey, you're off schedule. So <laughs> let me just find a, something that's mapped in the brain that I, I'll bring up a past experience why you can feel a little anger. <laughs> well, now once you become aware of that, you're working to become conscious of that and not go unconscious again. And it takes an incredible amount of awareness. Yes. It takes a great amount of consciousness and you can't have consciousness without energy. So you gotta raise your energy in order to get to it. Otherwise, you're gonna be consumed. You're gonna return back, right? So if you start becoming familiar, so conscious of those unconscious thoughts, they would never slip by your mind and check by you. And the research shows that you can get better at this. You could actually sense the thought before it comes. So then you start firing and wiring new thoughts. You start thinking to yourself, who am I gonna be when I open my eyes? Mm. Well, how, am I gonna, how am I gonna make a difference in the world today? Mm. Who am I gonna be? How am I gonna give? How am I gonna serve? How am I gonna contribute? What, are, what things do I wanna really do today? Mm. And the act of closing your eyes and just thinking about and rehearsing what you're gonna do. Your brain doesn't know the difference. Yes. And if you get caught up in it, you begin to install the neurological hardware in your brain to look like you've already done it. Now the brain's no longer a record of the past. You are priming your brain, and if you keep doing it, the hardware will become a software program. You know what that means? You just might start acting like a happy person. Mm. Well, there's no surprise there. Mm. You install the circuits. Stress hormones arouse the body so you have your attention on your body. Stress hormones alert the brain so you're aware of everything in your environment, like mm -hmm. an octopus with tentacles in all mm -hmm. different directions. You gotta control and predict everything in your life. Mm -hmm. And if you're living by the hormones of stress, you're always investing your attention and energy into the known future based on the past. So you're on a line of time here, in yes. a timeline. So then, let's think about it. How are you gonna make thought more real than anything else? How are you gonna create from thought? Well, let's close our eyes. Let's disconnect from the environment. Less sensory information coming into the brain. Less distraction, as you said. Let's play some soft music in the background. Let's stick some earplugs in our ear. Whatever you want to do. Diminish sensory. But now you're sitting down. You're not eating. You're not tasting. You're not smelling. You're not feeling. So there's more, less, less sensory input coming to your body. So then now mm. your brain waves begin to change. They start slowing down. And you move from this beta brainwave pattern where you're aware that you have a body in space and time or your attention is on the outer world or your senses are giving you information, mm -hmm. less sensory information. Now your inner world starts becoming more real than the outer world and you're not the voice in your head that's always talking to you. As your brain waves change, you start seeing in images and pictures and symbols and less in that vocalization, that sub-vocalization. So your brain waves start changing the alpha. You're gonna start creating, start dreaming, pretending. So then, if you say to your body, you're gonna sit down for an hour, you stay and your body's gonna say, I'm gonna die, my bladder's gonna explode, I need a coffee, I got a lot of emails yeah. to do. That's the program. And you say to your body, today we do battle. And you sit through that and you make your way, even though your body's trying to get up and you keep settling it back down, I'm telling you, when you start your day that day, you will be more kind, more loving, less judgmental, more patient, more present because you're mastering the present moment. That means you're not in the predictable future. You're not in the familiar past, you're mastering time. And so then, if where you place your attention is where you place your energy, and all of your attention is in the present moment, 
We've got a lot of energy to do amazing things. And you know when someone's present with you in your life because they're paying attention to you. And you know when they're not present yes. with you because they're not paying attention to you. So, so the act of getting more present means oh. you're putting a lot of energy in the present moment and you're taking your power back from all these things and people in your life. So we teach people this. As they start breaking through and they start being able to unfold into this field as an awareness and they're not putting their attention on their boss or their ex or their wife or their kids or their cell phone or their WhatsApp or their Facebook, they're not thinking at all. So then as they're sensing the space, they can't think. And if you can't think, you can't analyze. And if you can't analyze, the analytical mind is what separates the conscious mind from the subconscious. You just open the door. Wow. Now. Where you place your attention is where you place your energy. Why? Because we want this center to bloom. 1,400, 1,300 different chemicals that restore and regenerate the body. Let's breathe, let's open this up, let's practice this. Yeah, in the beginning, it's a little difficult, but you stay with it and you practice it, pedal by pedal by pedal, placing your attention there, you're putting your own life force. You're turning your love inward and the body will start responding. And in a week's time, if we're doing that three times a day or over and over again, sooner or later, that thing's gonna start blooming. And just like when your sexual organs are aroused and they're engorged with blood, this center, when you start feeling love, you make a chemical called oxytocin. Oxytocin signals nitric oxide. Nitric oxide sig signals a chemical called derived endothelial relaxing fact. It causes the arteries in your heart to literally open up. So your heart is going to be filled with blood and oxygen and nutrients. It's physiological. It's going to feel full. And when that happens, you experience a level of love that passes all understanding. You, your cup runneth over. Close your eyes. Retreat from your life. Disconnect from your body. Disconnect from your environment. Disconnect from your schedule. And just give yourself an hour or 45 minutes mm -hmm. or 20 minutes. Because when you invest in yourself, you invest in your future. And when you believe in yourself, you believe in possibilities. Mm -hmm. And when you believe in possibilities, you believe in yourself. And if you don't believe in possibilities, then you don't believe in yourself. And you don't believe in yourself, you don't believe in possibilities. But if you have a community, a living organism, and every, every stride you make feeds the living organism, every stride, every effort you make uh, to connect is, is amazing because that which we are seeking is seeking us. And so then when, when people have that uncompromising will, the same way that they go shopping for a dress or a pair, pair of earrings or go to the gym and work out, with the same intensity, with the same passion, come up against themselves and just say, when the body's going, given everything it has, it's when you say, that's all you got? I'm ready. And so then when you start overcoming that, the side effect of it is that all of a sudden you're happy for no reason and you're less seduced in believing that you need something outside of you to make you feel better. You're feeling better every day without anything outside of you. Do you think that you can change the circuits in your brain by thinking about it? So I did this experiment a little ways back. They took these people who uh, never played the piano before. And they separated them into four categories. And they said, listen, we're going to scan your brains before you learn this, these, uh, these exercises. And then we're going to scan your brain after. And all you have to do is show up for two hours a day in practice for two weeks. OK? And just follow the instructions. And we're going to hook your brain up to these sophisticated scans. And we're going to see what happens before and after. So they got with these people. And they said, OK, first group, here's the scales and here's the chords. They're one-handed exercises. Practice them over and over again. Keep playing them. So they played every single day, two hours a day for two weeks. They scanned their brains before, they scanned their brains after. After two weeks, guess what happened? A whole new set of circuits lit up in their brain that never lit up before. That makes sense. You learn something new. Learning is making new connections. Repeating it over and over again is sustaining or maintaining those connections, and that's called memory. So they memorized what they were doing by physically practicing or personalizing what they learned. Make sense? Standard, simple. They took the second group of people and they said, listen, we want you to play two hours a day for two weeks. We're going to scan your brain before and after. But you know what we're going to do? We're not going to tell you how to play anything. You just come and do whatever you want. Play whatever you want. So at the end of two weeks, guess what happened to them? Nothing. You know why? Because they couldn't remember what they had learned the day before. 
and they couldn't remember what they played the day before, and they, they had no structure. They got no instruction and no knowledge to be able to apply it to make some steady circuits. Took the third group of people, they said, listen, don't even show up. Don't even create your day. <laughs> Same thing. Nothing happens. Last group of people, they said, listen, we want you to come two hours a day for two weeks. We're going to show you these one-handed exercises. But instead of you physically playing the piano, we want you to mentally rehearse over and over again those exercises. And we know you're going to get tired, so we'll nudge you, and we'll keep you awake. But you practice for two hours a day, and you keep repeating those. At the end of two weeks, they rescan their brain, and guess what happened? Same area of the brain lit up as if they were actually playing the scales. Now, you know what that means? They grew new circuits in their brain just by thinking about it. Just by thinking, just by rehearsing. Now, every time we learn something new, we make new circuits in the brain. If you learn anything new, learning is making a new connection in the brain, new neurological connection. Memory is maintaining or sustaining those connections, keeping them alive. And the only way that we maintain and sustain connections in the brain is by repetition. Repetition allows the neurons to develop a long-term relationship. So these people, every single day, made it the most important thing. They gave up their social engagements. They gave up television. They said, I'm going to rehearse. I'm going to mentally rehearse the greatest ideal of myself every single day. And as long as I keep doing it every day, what's going to happen to those circuits? They're going to light up and become the more sustainable circuits to act as a platform of who they will become in the future. During this process of rehearsal, while they were sitting down rehearsing who they were going to be, just like the piano players, rehearsing over and over again, they had long moments where they lost track of time and space. In other words, they became so involved with what they were doing that when they opened their eyes or they lifted up their eye masks or when they turned the lights on in the room, it was two hours later and it only seemed like five minutes. They were so involved with what they were doing that they lost the feedback of the body, they lost the feedback from the environment, and they lost track of time. And the moment that that happens, geniuses, that's the moment we walk through the door to the quantum field. And that is the moment, by the way, according to neuroscience, that we repattern and rewire the brain. And by the way, guess what part of the brain is the most active when we do that? Frontal lobe, because isn't it true that we're making thought more real than anything else in that moment? And because the frontal lobe is the orchestra leader, it has its connections to the rest of the brain. And what it does is it quiets down the association centers, the thinking centers. It quiets down the motor centers. You don't want to move, you get still. It quiets down the emotional centers. And the only thing that's real is the thought. And when we capture that thought in the frontal lobe, when the frontal lobe captures it, as, as we hold that thought there, what happens is the rest of the neurons in the brain will pattern and make circuits to capture that thought and reflect it as a footprint of whatever we're focusing on. And when we make new circuits in our brain, by the way, do you think that we'll perceive things that maybe already existed but we never really saw? Do you think that's possible? Do you think that the person who lives practicing being a victim every day gets good at it? Turn that on automatically? Is it natural and second nature? And how will they perceive their world based on how they're wired? So if you made new circuits in your brain, do you think you may process or see things in, in your reality different because now you're wired to see them? Do you accept that? Yeah. So if I put up a picture of a Monet on the screen up here, and I said to you, isn't that a beautiful picture of uh, what Monet painted? You guys would all say, oh yeah, that's beautiful. And then I took the picture down and I said, did you guys know anything about Monet? Do you know that he spent 44 years of his life teaching himself how to see things differently? And he thought that every person was too busy to stop and pay attention to light. And he loved light. He loved the light first thing in the morning, and he loved the light at sunset, at the twilight hour. And he said that the golden light of the twilight hour and the brightness and the opalescent light in the morning actually colored reality. And that he said, if I can capture this in my paintings and make things bright enough and capture light, maybe people will stop and look and see what they never pay attention to. And then he said, you know, the wisteria and the bridge are one and the same. I can't paint them separate. They're the same to me. And as he got older, he developed cataracts. And the cataracts were so thick that when he looked at the light, it diffused the patterns. 
So he began to more and more paint exactly what he was seeing. And the doctors urged him to have an operation, to do something to help him. And you know what he said? I worked too hard to see this way. Now, if I took that painting and I put it back up on the screen, would you see it differently? Would you agree that because you learned new knowledge and new information, you made new circuits to perceive what was already there, but you never paid attention to? Yes. Reality is the same way. Now, there's only two ways that we make connections in the brain. Only two ways. The first way we make connections in the brain is from knowledge that we gain, information, philosophy. Every time you learn something semantically new, every time you learn a new bit of information, you made a new connection. Could you create a new experience that's going to produce a new sensory feedback to the brain that's going to have a new emotion? And that new emotion then will help you to remember that experience better? And so can you picture in the quantum field future experiences that you would like to have that have nothing to do with survival, yes. nothing to do with pain, nothing to do with sexuality, nothing to do with success and power and control, but all those virtues that we secretly hope for, those are the end products of being able to experience something different than survival. But you see, we're so wired for survival that the human being thinks that what's happening out there is more real than what's happening in here. What makes us so unique, geniuses, as human beings, is that when other species are subjected to harsh environmental conditions, right? They have to continuously expose themselves to it over and over again until they start to modify their behavior. And as they start to modify their behavior, after several generations, they may be able to change their genetics and produce a, a way to acclimate or, or change as a result of that environmental stimuli. What's that called? Evolution. Right? But that may take thousands of years. Human being doesn't have to do that. Human being, because of the size of the frontal lobe, can change in a year, can modify themselves in a week, can become a different person in a day. We can evolve ourselves and become somebody else and not have to go through the long continuum of trial and error. Why not fall in love with an abstraction, something that you haven't experienced yet? But if you can put all of your mind into that abstraction, don't you think that that abstraction will be your future? Don't you think that's possible? And don't you think you'll wire your brain to be exactly what your future dictates? You see, we can't get anything in our life that we're not first wired for. You can't be wealthy unless you're wired for wealth. So once we're wired for it, implicitly wired, non-declaratively wired, when we've wired it so much that we don't have to think about it anymore, that's the moment we are it. And that's the moment it takes no effort to have the side effect of who we are as a mind show up in our life. I have a friend who's a millionaire. I went to lunch with him. He said, today I lost everything that I owned, past the ketchup. And I looked at him and I pushed the ketchup over there. And I was talking to me and I said, Jerry, aren't, aren't you upset? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, you lost everything you, you, know, you owned. He said, what? He said, I am money. I'm, I'm, I've made it thousands of times. I've made it a hundred times. I'm going to go make it back in two weeks. So the question is, who are we going to rehearse ourselves to be every morning? Can you rehearse in the morning your greatest ideal and activate those circuits? And as you rehearse those ideals for yourself and activate those circuits, won't they be the platform of who you become? I think people right now, because they're so informed, uh, are beginning to realize it's not enough to just know, that this is a time in history to know how. We have never, in all the things studies we've done, we've never seen people be able to change their brainwaves as quickly and as efficiently as this particular group. It's the scale is off the charts. 80% of our participants had a more than 90% change in their brain for the better in four days to create more heart coherence so that you can self-regulate your emotional state independent of what's going on in your outer environment. Uh, and so we've kind of narrowed it down to a formula. So the evidence 
that we're seeing in our scientific measurements sits on this side. And it's objective. It's not just subjective. You saying, oh, I feel better at the end of the event. No, well, <laughs> we have science to prove that it's not just in your mind. It's in your brain. It's not just in your mind. It's in your body, right? And then there's this other arena that's starting to unfold that is, that, that, that's actually surprising me on a daily basis. And I'm, I'm so changed because of it. Because in our week-long events, we're witnessing in miracles of biblical proportion. And I'm talking about blind people seeing, deaf people hearing, tumors shrinking, uh, MS, huge changes, people with crutches and, and walkers or walking without them. I mean, we're seeing very significant changes taking place. For the people that, um, that this is making a lot of sense to, but they're still stuck in this daily routine, and logically this all makes sense, how do you get people to like make that first step where they can maybe have that one day or that one hour where they're like, wow, I actually just took everything Dr. Joe said and I see a little bit of evidence, maybe I can now take the next step and the next step. Yeah. If you can't think greater than how you feel, <laughs> we've studied the brain scans of people who are thinking in a meditation within some disturbing emotion. And a hundred percent of the time, Brian, they make their brain worse. Really? They are driving it further into higher beta brainwave patterns because, first of all, the arousal of the stress hormones is causing you to become overly analytical, and analysis isn't going to do it. Even the insight from analysis isn't going to change it. And then, secondly, the emotion is a record of the past, so you're thinking in the past the solution is getting beyond it. So breaking that cycle is a, is short the refractory period of those emotional reactions is is the gift, right? And and I don't care that you react. The question is, how long are you going to react, right? That's the fundamental question. We have seen dramatic, and I mean dramatic changes in people's health okay. instantaneously because it's not matter that emits a field when you study the science. It's the field that creates matter. Okay. If you change the field, <laughs> you're going to change matter. And that just takes a change in belief because most people think they need to change the matter. They need to change the tumor. It's not your job to change the tumor. That's matter to matter. You have to change the pattern or, or, the, or, the, or, the, or, the, or the information in the field. I think, it's, I think the best way to say it is if you're not defined by a vision of the future, you're left with the memories of the past. And people literally believe in their past more than they believe in their future. That's why they talk about their past more right. than they talk about their future. People romance their past. They're more in love with their past than they are in love with the future. And people who actually create amazing things in their life just were more in love with their future. And they kept it alive in their mind every day. And they, like feeding a, a plant or, or a garden, they're, they're tending to that future every single day. And they're deli the delight that comes with it and the excitement that comes with it and the emotions that come with it cause them to literally change their brain and body over time to begin to look like the future has already happened. Now think about that. If there's evidence in your brain and body by thought alone, evidence that looks like you've already experienced your future, what does that mean? It's already happened. So relax, because it's going to find you and it's going to come in a way that you least expect. That's, that's the beauty behind this. The, if you could exp you predict it, it's nothing new. It's got to surprise you. The brain learns by mistakes and surprises. So why not be surprised by an unknown coincidence or opportunity or synchronicity? And, and the moment you notice what you did inside of you that produced that effect outside of you, you're going to pay attention to what you did and you're going to do it again. And you're going to believe less that you are the victim of your life. You know, someone or something is controlling your feelings and thoughts. So all of a sudden realizing your feelings and thoughts begin to create an outcome in your life. I think that that experience then causes a human being to feel empowered. They start to believe in themselves more. And I think when we believe in ourselves, I think we believe in possibility. And when we believe in possibilities, I think we, we really believe in ourselves. And, and getting people to that point, to realize that nobody's excluded from this. It doesn't, I, you can't tell me any longer that you're too old to do this. We have brain scans of people in their 80s that will blow your mind and they, they could can be watching. You always focus on a future of yours. And, and, and by and, doing that, you can start healing yourself in all ways. You can't tell me you're too sick to do this right. work. I've seen super sick people with 50 brain tumors turn their life around. They have no brain tumors, 50 brain tumors. Okay, future. I, you can't tell me that uh, you had a turbulent past and you can't do this work. I've seen people 
that had the most abusive past that are the happiest people in the world. Okay. You can't even tell me that you never meditated before because many times the people who have never meditated have the most profound experience because they're not expecting anything. You, right. you can't tell me you're too overweight, you're too underweight. You can't tell me any of that. You can't tell me you're the too this or too that. I've seen it in all shapes, all sizes, all colors, all ages. The stronger the emotion that we feel from some external event in our life, the more altered we feel inside of us as a result of that condition outside of us, the more we pay attention to the cause and the brain narrows its focus on whatever it is that's sitting there and it freezes an image and it takes a snapshot and that's called a memory. So the higher the emotional quotient, the more fear, the more uh, pain, the more shock, the more um, anger, whatever it is, the more we pay attention to the cause and so then we create long-term memories that way. Now the challenge is, is that every time we think about that trauma, uh, we're producing the same chemistry in the brain and body as if it was happening again. So <clears throat> some people after an event like that are literally re-experiencing it a hundred times in one day. And this is a crazy thing because what it does is it activates the survival gene. And when you're in survival, what you want to do is make sure that that doesn't happen again. So what you start to do unconsciously is you start to begin to forecast what you'll do if it happens again, right? And you start selecting a worst case scenario in your mind. And then you think, well, what if this happens? What if that happens? And you start to even make it even more, you get more creative, right? And every time you do that, you start experiencing the emotion of that future based on the pain of your past, the fear of your past, the anxiety of your past, the depression of your past. And so the person's conditioning their brain and body into the past and at the same time, they're literally bracing themselves for the worst case scenario in their life because in survival, if you prepare for the worst, there's better chances of survival. And you could have 10 really great things go on in your life and you can have one bad thing and you keep focusing on that one bad thing because you gotta be prepared for it happening again. So right. people unconsciously then spend their whole life looking around the corner, waiting for it to occur, and they're on guard. Now that's not right. a conscious process. Common in PTSD from soldiers. So, so They're common. constantly looking for the roadside bombs and right. they're highly elevated and it's very sub, it's unconscious. It's so, what they're doing is when you're, when you're in that brainwave state, you're sweeping your environment to determine if there's anything out of order. And you're doing that because the brain is on such an aroused state. In, in survival and stress, the brain is in a very alert state and the brainwave patterns are high beta. You're super aroused, you're super alert because you're vigilant about one thing out of pattern that looks unusual or unrecognizable. And the moment you see that, <laughs> it's that thought that opens the door to the conditioning that you've been creating all along. Remember, this is not a conscious process. It's no different than ringing a bell and watching a dog salivate. <laughs> the stimulus is also causing an automatic, autonomic, physiological, chemical change that's taking place in the person's body. And that person literally, from a biological standpoint, is back in that event. Right. And they're gonna behave in almost the same way that they did then because they're trapped in survival, right? Right, and like you said, that's a snapshot. A lot of people never ended up talking about that event because there's a shameful process mm -hmm. there. So it, it literally stays there. You're frozen. You're you, frozen. You've stopped, from that point forward, you've stopped evolving. What, what we're saying is that if you can't overcome that emotion, then you can't create anything new because that emotion is keeping you tacked to the past, right? Mm -hmm. So it, then your, your whole future is written then. It's just, it's, it's, it's kind done. Of, yeah, it's done. It, it's done. You're in a box, right? You're in, wow. you're in a box. So what we know, uh, according to functional scans, is that talking about it helps to diminish some of the emotions, but it doesn't really change the brain or body that much. You, you can talk about it. You can have some insights, but until you begin to make fundamental changes, you're not gonna go anywhere. That for me, it's never about the event. 
The event is incidental. It's about the emotion. So then when you start lowering the volume to that emotion and you teach a person how to get beyond their analytical mind, enter the operating system where those subconscious programs exist, change their brain waves and begin to make significant changes. When they start making those subconscious changes, they're less reactionary. You teach them how to find the present moment. You teach them over time the tedium returning back to the present moment and managing their attention, managing their energy. And you are literally training an animal that has really poor manners. The body's been just conditioned to be like a, a feral animal that's in survival. But when you start working with it and you keep settling it down, you're breaking that conditioning response and you're telling it it's no longer the mind of anger, that you're the mind. And then this is where David starts slaying Goliath. This is where every time you start doing that, in the beginning it takes a lot of effort and a lot of energy. But if you keep practicing, we have, we have so many brain scans to show so many people healing from anxiety and depression. You can't be anxious if you're in the present moment. <laughs> you can't be depressed if you're in the present moment. You're, you're in the present moment. You're not thinking about the future or the past. And you start managing that world, then the body that's holding on to that emotion, when it finally finally gets trained, like a training an animal to sit. If you're working with it, sooner or later, if you keep telling it and training it to sit, sooner or later it's going to acquiesce, sooner or later it's going to surrender to another mind. And when that happens, boom, there's this liberation of energy. How many people believe in the idea that the way you think has some effect on your life? That your thoughts are intimately connected to your future? So your thoughts in some way create your reality. You believe that? So how many people in this audience have a clear vision of their future. You see, you think 60 to 70,000 thoughts in one day. Out of those 60 to 70,000 thoughts that you think in one day, 90% of those thoughts are the same thoughts as the day before. So if you believe that your thoughts somehow are connected to your life, then the same thoughts always lead to the same choices. The same choices always lead to the same behaviors. The same behaviors create the same experiences, and the same experiences produce the same emotions. And those very same emotions drive the very same thoughts. And your biology, your neurocircuitry, your neurochemistry, your neurohormones, and even your genetic expression is equal to how you think, how you act, and how you feel. And how you think, how you act, and how you feel is called your personality. And your personality creates your personal reality. That's it. So then, if you wanted to create a new personal reality, a new life, then you would have to start thinking about what you've been thinking about and change it. You would have to become aware of your unconscious thoughts and observe them. You would have to pay attention to your automatic habits and behaviors and modify them. And you would have to look at the emotions you live by every single day that are connected to your past and decide if those emotions belong in your future. You see, most people try to create a new personal reality as the same personality and it doesn't work. You literally have to become someone else. So your brain is organized to reflect everything you know in your life. Your brain is a record of the past. It's an artifact 
of all the things you've learned and experienced to this moment. So if you wake up every morning and get out of bed on the same side, shut the alarm clock off with the same finger, shuffle into the bathroom and use the toilet like you always do, go and get a cup of coffee and drink coffee out of your favorite mug, then get in the shower and wash yourself off in the same routine way, drive to work, get to work, see the same people that push the same emotional buttons, do the same things that you've memorized and do so well, then hurry up and go home, and hurry up and check your emails, and hurry up and check your Facebook, then hurry up and go to bed. Here's my question. Did your brain change at all that day? We could say that you were thinking the same thoughts, performing the same unconscious actions, living by the same emotions, but secretly expecting your life to change. So there's a principle in neuroscience. And the principle says, nerve cells that fire together, wire together. So if you're thinking the same thoughts, making the same choices, demonstrating the same behaviors, reproducing the same experiences that stamp the same networks of neurons into the same patterns, and then produce the same emotions, you're going to hardwire your brain into a very finite signature. Because as you fire and wire the same circuits in the same way, those circuits begin to become more connected. And by the time you're 35 years old, this is science now, we become a set of memorized behaviors, unconscious habits, automatic emotional reactions, beliefs and perceptions, and even attitudes that function just like a computer program. And if you do something over and over and over again, the repetition of those actions over time conditions your body to know how to do it well, better than your mind. And a habit is when your body knows better than your mind. Where you've done something so many times that the body now knows how to do it better than the brain. And so 95% of most people's behaviors, attitudes, thoughts, beliefs, emotional reactions are subconscious programs. So why is that important? Because you're here this week to learn new information. And every time you learn something new, you make new connections in your brain. That's what learning is. Learning is forging new synaptic connections. Physical evidence as a result of your interaction in the environment and the footprints of consciousness is called learning, making new connections. And the Nobel Prize laureate Kandel in the year 2000 found that when people learned one bit of information, they doubled the number of connections in their brain from 1,300 connections to 2,600 connections. But if they didn't review that information, if they couldn't repeat it, if they couldn't remember it, those circuits pruned apart in hours or days. So if learning is making new synaptic connections, then remembering is maintaining and sustaining those connections. And you are here this week to learn vital information about creating a future and be defined by a vision of the future instead of the memories of the past. Because if you are not defined by some vision that is bigger than you and you are not passionate about that vision, then you're left with the old hardware of the past in your brain and you will be predictable in your life. So would you agree then? New thoughts, new information should lead to new choices. New choices should lead to new behaviors. 
And new behaviors should create new experiences. And new experiences should produce new emotions. And those new emotions should drive new thoughts. And that's called evolution. So if your brain is a record of the past, and you don't have a vision of the future, then you are living in the past. And you will never arrive at that new future. So then if you wake up in the morning and you are not being defined by a vision that's bigger than you and it doesn't get you out of bed and inspire you into possibility and you get up living from the old hardware of the past and the old emotions stored in your body do you know what's going to happen to you? You're going to wake up and you're going to open your eyes and you're going to see the same people and go to the same places and do the exact same thing at the exact same time and the moment you open your eyes all of a sudden now it's your external environment that's controlling how you think and feel because you have a neurological network in your brain for every person you know every place that you go everything that you own everything that you do and the moment you open your eyes and you see the same people and go to the same places and do the exact same thing at the exact same time, it's your external environment that's turning on different circuits in your brain causing you to think equal to everything that you know. And you told me you believe that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny. And as long as you're th thinking equal to your environment, you keep creating the same life to change to truly change is to think greater than your environment to think greater than the circumstances in your life to think greater than the conditions in your world and every great person in history knew this whether it was Mahatma Gandhi Martin Luther King the Wright brothers Joan of Arc they all had a vision couldn't see it, couldn't smell it, couldn't taste it, couldn't feel it, but it was alive in their mind. It was so alive in their mind that they began to live as if that future reality was happening in the present moment. And so the moment you stop making the same choices that you always make, get ready because it's going to be uncomfortable. And that's the moment you are heading towards the new self. And we call it stepping into the river of change. But now, remember, 95% of who you are is your body as the mind. You know, you've done something enough times that your body does it better than your brain. So you may actually complain unconsciously because your body does it all the time. And all of a sudden you say, no complaining, no more blaming, no more feeling sorry for myself, no more talking about other people, I'm going to stop. You know what happens, don't you? The body starts sending signals to the brain. The body's been conditioned that way. And all of a sudden you start hearing the thoughts in your head that say, why don't you start tomorrow? Tomorrow's a better day. This is too hard for me. I can't change. Something's wrong with me. It's my mother's fault. It's my ex-husband's fault. It's my ex-wife's fault. I'm this way because of this event. Or the most important one, this doesn't feel right. And the moment you respond to that thought as if it's true, that thought leads to the same choice which leads to the same behavior, that creates the same experience, that produces the same emotion, and the person says, this feels right. That feels familiar. Going from the old self to the new self, stepping into that void, stepping into that uncertainty, is the biological, the neurological, the chemical, the hormonal genetic death of the old self. And people will say to us, well, in that unknown, I can't predict my life or my future. And we always say the same thing to them. 
the best way to predict your future is to create it, not from the known, but from the unknown. And when you and I get comfortable in the place of the unknown, that's where the magic happens, and it never happens in the known. My guest today is Dr. Joe Dispenza, the New York Times bestselling author, international lecturer, researcher, and educator. Your work focuses on the intersection of neuroscience, epigenetics, and quantum physics, driven by the conviction that each of us has the potential for greatness. You specialize in teaching people to rewire their brains and recondition their bodies to make lasting changes. Dr. Joe, welcome back to London. We have you back because people want to hear your message. YouTube doesn't lie, you know, it shows what the people want. I honestly think that we're in an age of information. And in an age of information, ignorance is a choice. I don't want people to be intimidated because the, what science shows is factual, right? So they're more likely to believe in that. And the moment you use a word from some tradition or some religion or for some sect or culture, some people shut off. They have a stigma about it that really limits their participation because of their past experience, because of their beliefs. Most people live by the same feelings every single day. You know, people wake up in the morning and your brain is a record of the past. So you wake up and you start thinking about your problems and your problems are connected to certain people and things at certain times and places. The moment you start activating those circuits of memories related to the past experience in the environment you're thinking in the past. Because every person, every thing, every place has a neurological network in your brain because you've experienced it. The end product of an experience is an emotion. So when you start thinking about your problems, you start feeling the emotions associated with them. You start feeling unhappy. So your, your thoughts are the vocabulary of your brain. Your feelings are the vocabulary of your body. How you think and feel creates your state of being. So most people start their day, every single day, reaffirming their entire state of being in the familiar past. Then they rush to the predictable future, right? And this is probably 99.99% .99 of humans in the world wake up. In doing that in unconscious and habitually. So then they go through the same routine behaviors that they've been doing for the last five years in their, their habitat is reinforcing their habits. And they're, and they're going through a series of unconscious choices, behaviors, experiences, and emotions. And they do that for 10 years, they're on autopilot. And their body's dragging them into a predictable future based on what they did in the past. And they've, in a sense, lost their free will to a program. I assert if you're not in the present moment, you're running a program. So if a person's living by guilt and they don't know it's guilt because it just feels like them, they've been feeling that way every single day or suffering, and those emotions are driving their thoughts, and if they can't think greater than how they feel, and feelings and emotions are a record of the past or thinking in the past. If you think you're a failure, you feel like a failure. Once you feel like a failure, you think you're more of a failure. And people get caught in these loops. Okay, and when I'm stuck in my anger loop, I need to use another emotion to get myself out of that, not the analytical thinking. Well, just ask yourself this question. Who is that anger hurting? Me and everyone around me. <laughs> yeah, so first your body, right? Because there's some toxicity in the long term. In fact, short term, it's fine. But if you're caught in the, the rush of anger f over and over again, well, you're down-regulating the gene, right? And if you're thinking about the problem, check this out, you're thinking about the problem and it's creating the response of anger. You're conditioning your body to become the mind of anger. In other words, conditioning just takes a thought or an image and a feeling or an emotion. So and every time you do that, you're conditioning your body to become more dependent on anger. So what you have to do is, you have to remember. That means then you, you would have to apply some type of exercise or some type of skill to stop, close your eyes, work on your breathing, elevate your emotional state, remember the feelings of your future instead of the feelings of your past. In other words, if you're creating a wonderful future and you feel the emotions of that future and you feel like you're connected to the energy of your future, the moment you get angry and frustrated, you just disconnected from the energy of your future and now you're back to the energy of your past and don't expect anything to change. But that's okay. It's not, the, it's not a bad thing. Well, we're human, right? right? But you take a moment and say, what's more important, this or my future? Okay, give me a minute. It's going to take me a little bit. It may take me an hour to pass the chemicals, but let's go. 
Okay. And so people are starting to do that more and more, and the reality that they're perceiving is incidental now compared to what they're creating in their future. So they're reacting less to their environment and they're investing more of their attention and energy into a new future. So it's all about that future. And yet most of us live our lives in the past and everything is based on the past and we're all triggered on these past pieces. Sure, the best way to say it is if you're not defined by a vision of the future, you're left with the memories of the past. And people literally believe in their past more than they believe in their future. That's why they talk about their past more than they talk about their future. People romance their past and more in love with their past than they are in love with the future. And people who actually create amazing things in their life just were more in love with their future and they kept it alive in their mind every day and they like feeding a, a plant or a, or a garden. They're, they're tending to that future every single day and the delight that comes with it and the excitement that comes with it and the emotions that come with it cause them to literally change their brain and body over time to begin to look like the future has already happened. Now think about that. If there's evidence in your brain and body by thought alone, evidence that looks like you've already experienced your future, what does that mean? It's already happened, so relax because it's going to find you and it's going to come in a way that you least expect. That's, that's the beauty behind this. The, if you could have predicted, it's nothing new. It's got to surprise you. The brain learns by mistakes and surprises. So why not be surprised by an unknown coincidence or opportunity or synchronicity? And, and the moment you notice what you did inside of you that produced that effect outside of you, you're going to pay attention to what you did and you're going to do it again and you're going to believe less that you are the victim of your life. You know, someone or something is controlling your feelings and thoughts. So all of a sudden realizing your feelings and thoughts begin to create an outcome in your life. I think that that experience then causes a human being to feel empowered. They start to believe in themselves more. And I think when we believe in ourselves, I think we believe in possibility. And when we believe in possibilities, I think we, we really believe in ourselves. And, and getting people to that point to realize that nobody's excluded from this. It doesn't, I, you can't tell me any longer that you're too old to do this. We have brain scans of people in their 80s that will blow your mind and right. they, they you can, can be watching. You always focus on a future of yours. And, and, and by and, doing that, you can start healing yourself in all ways. You can't tell me you're too sick to do this right. work. I've seen super sick people with 50 brain tumors turn their life around. They have no brain tumors, 50 brain tumors. You can't tell me that you had a turbulent past and you can't do this work. I've seen people that had the most abusive past are the happiest people in the world. You can't even tell me that you never meditated before because many times the people who have never meditated have the most profound experience because they're not expecting anything. You, right. you can't tell me you're too overweight, you're too underweight. You can't tell me any of that. You can't tell me you're the too this or too that. I've seen it in all shapes, all sizes, all colors, all ages. You mentioned all... the, the, abu the abuse of past. Um, and I would, I would love it if we could talk a little bit about trauma today. When you see people go through trauma, Joe, um, do you see sometimes that some of that is passed through DNA, through culture, and then how do you end up? Because you must have a whole room full of people with different traumas, yeah. physical, emotional. Yeah. How do you look at that phenomenon and, and how do you get people talking about that? The stronger the emotion that we feel from some external event in our life, the more altered we feel inside of us as a result of that condition outside of us, the more we pay attention to the cause and the brain narrows its focus on whatever it is that's sitting there and it freezes an image and it takes a snapshot and that's called a memory. So the higher the emotional quotient, the more fear, the more uh, pain, the more shock, the more um, anger, whatever it is, the more we pay attention to the cause and so then we create long-term memories that way. Now the challenge is, is that every time we think about that trauma, we're producing the same chemistry in the brain and body as if it was happening again. So <clears throat> some people after an event like that are literally re-experiencing it a hundred times in one day. And this is a crazy thing because what it does is it activates the survival gene. And when you're in survival, what you want to do is make sure that that doesn't happen again. So what you start to do unconsciously is you start to begin to forecast 
what you'll do if it happens again, right? And you start selecting a worst case scenario in your mind. And then you think, well, what if this happens? What if that happens? And you start to even make it even more, you get more creative, right? And every time you do that, you start experiencing the emotion of that future based on the pain of your past, the fear of your past, the anxiety of your past, the depression of your past. And so the person's conditioning their brain and body into the past and at the same time they're literally bracing themselves for the worst case scenario in their life because in survival if you prepare for the worst there's better chances of survival and you could have 10 really great things go on in your life and you can have one bad thing and you keep focusing on that one bad thing because you got to be prepared for it happening again so mm. people unconsciously then spend their whole life looking around the corner waiting for it to occur and they're on guard now that's not right. a conscious process common in PTSD from soldiers S so they're common. constantly looking for the roadside bombs and right. they're highly elevated and it's very sub it's unconscious a lot it's so what they're doing is when you're in that brainwave state you're sweeping your environment to determine if there's anything out of order and you're doing that because the brain is on such an aroused state in, in survival and stress the brain is in a very alert state and the brainwave patterns are high beta you're super aroused you're super alert because you're vigilant about one thing out of pattern that looks unusual or unrecognizable and the moment you see that <laughs> It's that thought that opens the door to the conditioning that you've been creating all along. Remember, this is not a conscious process. It's no different than ringing a bell and watching a dog salivate. The stimulus is also causing an automatic, autonomic, physiological, chemical change that's taking place in the person's body. And that person literally, from a biological standpoint, is back in that event. Right. And they're gonna behave in almost the same way that they did then because they're st trapped in survival. Right, and like you said, that's a snapshot. A lot of people never ended up talking about that event because there's a shameful process mm -hmm. there. So it, it literally stays there. You're frozen. You're you, frozen. You've stopped, from that point forward, you've stopped evolving. What, what we're saying is that if you can't overcome that emotion, then you can't create anything new because that emotion is keeping you tacked to the past, right? Mm -hmm. So then your, your whole future is written then. It's just, it's, it's, it's kinda, done. Yeah, it's done. It, it's done. You're in a box, right? You're in, wow. you're in a box. So the problem is not that it's just in the brain, Brian. The problem is it's in the body as well, because it's the emotion that's conditioning the body subconsciously into the past. And now we're 5% conscious mind, 95% subconscious mind. So then that becomes a very profoundly distinct program for that person. So they lose interest in any other thing that is not related to the emotion they're experiencing. In fact, no new information can enter their nervous system that isn't equal to the emotion that they're experiencing because it's not relevant. Right. <laughs> they're in survival. Survival says, be prepared for what's about ready to happen. Be prepared for the worst. Be ready. Don't let it get you this time. Know what you're gonna do and it's usually you know, a very primitive reaction. But if you keep practicing, you know, we have so many brain scans to show so many people healing from anxiety and depression. You can't be anxious if you're in the present moment. <laughs> you can't be depressed if you're in the present moment. You're, you're in the present moment. You're not thinking about the future or the past. And you start managing that world, then the body that's holding on to that emotion, when it finally, finally gets trained, like a training an animal to sit, if you're working with it, sooner or later, if you keep telling it and training it to sit, sooner or later it's gonna acquiesce, sooner or later it's gonna surrender to another mind. And when that happens, boom, there's this liberation of energy. When you strike it and you hit it, it is the most incredibly electric feeling you will ever mm. have. It is the most familiar, unfamiliar feeling huh. you will ever have. You will swear that you are ancient in that moment. You will feel it in every single cell of your body. And I mean like a, a vibration, a, a coherence, where your body becomes electric. If you close your eyes and you begin to think about doing something, you're an athlete, you understand this. If your uh, uh, background in football and you are running a pattern or you are doing something, you would rehearse it in your mind. Yeah. Turns out, 
that the act of mentally rehearsing something when you're truly present your brain does not know the difference mm -hmm. between what's going on out there and what's going on in here. In fact, your brain will begin to look like you've been doing it for the last five days and you've never run the course. Mm -hmm. So now your brain is no longer a record of the past because typically it is. Now it's a map to the future. So wow. now you're priming your brain. So that became the very platform. You know, experiments with piano players. You know, you take a group of people that never played the piano before. You divide them into two different categories. You take one group of people, you teach them one-handed scales and chords, you do a brain scan on them, they come and practice for two hours a day for five days. At the end of five days, if you rescan the brain, they grow new circuits on the opposite side of the brain. Nothing magical there, you learn something new, learning's making new connections. Get some instruction, you get instruction, you get your body involved, you get your body involved, you're gonna have an experience, experience enriches the brain. Pay attention to what you're doing, you gotta pay attention and repeat it, firing and wiring, you're gonna assemble new circuits. You can take the other group of people, have them come for two hours a day for five days, do a brain scan before and the brain scan after. Have them close their eyes and mentally rehearse playing those scales and chords. At the end of five days, <laughs> they'll grow the same amount of circuits in their oh. brain as the people who actually physically demonstrated the action. What does that mean? It means not only do they change their brain by thinking differently, but their brain looks like they've been playing the piano for five days. Now set them in front of a piano, never played the piano before, they'll play those scales and chords because their brain is wired wow. to play it. So now, the act of rehearsing who they're going to be, what are the qualities and beginning to get in this creative state, began to lay down the circuits of a new personality. And a new personality is connected to a new personal reality. So the next question is, mm. does that change the body? Take a group of men, have them do one-handed uh, curls in their mind and bring an emotional component like stronger, harder, more intense, one hour a day for two weeks. At the end of two weeks, 13.5 increase in muscle strength, wow. never lifted a weight. Now their body is changing by thought alone. Huh. This is fascinating because, you know, growing up in this religion that I grew up, it was a constant reminder of daily practice to think in a certain way, mm -hmm. to think that you can never be physically harmed, mm -hmm. that you're infinite love, that you're infinite light, your infinite soul, spirit, life, truth, and love, right? Mm -hmm. It was a constantly taught to me that I'm, that I'm never able to get physically harmed. Mm -hmm. And that if you are, that means your thought is off and you just have to recorrect your thought and you'll have a healing, mm -hmm. right? It's a little extreme for some because, and if you're not, you know, well practiced in it and if you don't know how to really manage the thoughts and train, then you can hurt yourself. Yeah, exactly. You can really hurt your body and that's, you know, it happened. Right? Yeah. It happened for times. Um, but I use this, you know, philosophy, strategy, technique, idea in sports. And I would rehearse constantly, like you talked about, I was constantly mm -hmm. rehearsing the games, what I wanted to create for the season, for my, my body, for my life. Mm -hmm. And it's, it just seemed like it would always happen. And I remember I would watch um, game film of world record holders in track and field and football and watch them every single night and mentally rehearse the same movements they would have before I would fall asleep. And then I'd practice the next day. But I was constantly rehearsing in my mind how I wanted to show up. I was rehearsing this moment. Mm -hmm. You know, in my life, 10 years ago, I was rehearsing what I'd be doing this year in my mm -hmm. life. If you're living by those elevated states and you know how to feel that emotion of your future before it happens, you're less likely to wait for it to happen because you'll feel like it already happened. You're less likely to try to control it. You'll know that the moment you lose the feeling, you just disconnect it and you're gonna make your way back. And when you get good at it, no person, no thing, no experience can take it away from you. Wow. Now you're empowered. And if you understand the laws of how creation happens, then you're less likely to compete and rush to get what you want. You're gonna know that it's gonna come to you. And now that's the new model of how we create. Now people say to me, well, I'm this way because of that person and that thing. I would say to them, so you mean then that person or that experience out there is controlling your thoughts and feelings? Right. <gasps> that means you're a victim to your environment. But when you start changing your thoughts and feelings and it starts to produce an effect in your environment, you're gonna change the belief that you're a victim consciously or subconsciously of your life to becoming more of a creator of your life. Mm. And now all of a sudden when you become more a creator of your life, you can't blame anybody. You can't say, well, that person or that thing, you'd have to say, I got to be greater than that right. environmental condition. Who in history can I study that had the same challenges? What, was, what, what did they do? Let me just work that into my rehearsal. 
so that I can improve, right? Just like you've right. done with sports, it's the right. same process. Yeah. When do you experience the most love? Ooh, personally. I, yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so it turns out that the signature of the quantum field is greater and greater degrees of oneness and wholeness, right? So think about it. Um, when we live in stress, we live in separation, right? Because our senses fool us into believing you're there and I'm here and everybody is separate from us and everything is separate from us. That's 3D reality, right? Wow. But as you start opening the center, all of a sudden, when you become nobody, no one, no thing, nowhere and no time, right? That's the moment that your consciousness lines up with the consciousness of the field. That's when you are totally present. Now, here's the deal. If I can get people to believe that just because they can't see something doesn't mean it doesn't exist, that they can just connect and pay attention to that field and stay present with it and become more aware of it, moment after moment after moment, every interaction with that invisible field, every experience lays down new circuits in their brain for them to perceive more of it, right? Mm -hmm. So then as they keep their attention on it, they start moving closer and closer to it so they experience less separation and more oneness and wholeness. Mm -hmm. So then when that happens, there's a cascade of all kinds of physical and chemical and energetic things that begin to happen. So for me, the, the best way that I can describe that field is it's intelligent love. It's greater levels of order and unity and oneness. And when you strike it and you hit it, it is the most incredibly electric feeling you will ever mm -hmm. have. It is the most familiar unfamiliar feeling huh. you will ever have. You will swear that you are ancient in that moment and you will connect. And it won't be just like love for your puppy. You will feel it in every single cell of your body. And I mean like a, a vibration, a, a coherence where your body becomes electric. And the only way we can describe that is love. You, 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 you yeah. taste that one time. You want it and all the time. Okay, here's what I say. I always say, the first time it happens, the first time it happened to me, and every time since, when I come back to my senses, I always say the same thing. Joe Dispenza, you got this all wrong. Because some veneer, some conditioning is lifted. You start realizing that the way you think life is, isn't that way. Do I react in my life? Yep, I do. But the question is, how long are you gonna react? That's the real question. Because if you keep that emotional reaction going on for an extended period of time, sooner or later it'll become your identity. And then people say, why are you so bitter? Why are you so frustrated? Why are you suffering so much? In your brain, in that emotion, you're in the emotion, which means you're in the chemical residue of the past, is going to call up the event because you're emotionally connected to it. And you're gonna say, I'm this way because of that past experience. So then, imagine what I do with people. I, we have people that have been abused, we have people that have been traumatized, that have been um, assaulted. We have people that have had very, very difficult, difficult pasts. And have you ever heard me say to, to revisit the event? Have you ever heard me say that? Never do we need to revisit the event because once you do, you open the box. But what we want to do is overcome the emotion because that's just what's lasting from the event. So you sit a person down, and the moment you sit them down, what do you think the body is going to do? It's going to look for something to recreate that emotion, because that's the person's identity. Are you with me still? So if I make, make the person, if I inspire the person to sit there, and they're sitting there, and all of a sudden they're noticing that they're hot, and they're irritated, and their stomach is twisting and all of a sudden it's a, a group of sensations a group of feelings that they have called all along frustration but the different sensations the moment you name it it becomes an emotion 
But what it is is just bodily sensations. It's energy that's stuck in the body. So the body is looking to go back to the past. It's believing it's in the past. Are you with me still? So if the person becomes aware that their body is doing that, and like training an animal, allow the body to feel that emotion and then settle it down into the present moment. When you settle it down into the present moment, the body starts to trust the present moment and move out of the past. And there's a release of energy. Then the body goes, well, wait, wait, wait a second, what's going to happen in the next moment? And it starts doing that. And it starts to try and anticipate the future. And you settle the body back down into the present moment. And every time you do that, you're telling the body it's no longer the mind that you're the mind and your will is getting greater than the program and all of a sudden you start to lower the volume to that emotion and when you bring begin to break the addiction to that emotion the side effect of breaking that addiction is called joy it's called freedom all of a sudden the body's saying I don't want to be tormented anymore now does that mean you shouldn't grieve over things that you lose? Grieving is a biological process. It's neural pruning. It's a death of circuitry. It's a death of emotions. It's, it's the absence, a void of something in your life. And that's important. But in grief, sooner or later, you've got to come to a greater understanding about death, a greater understanding about loss, a greater understanding so that you can adapt to those conditions. Every time I sit with someone and they start complaining about their life and I let them go for a few minutes and then I go, oh, you know what I say to them? You only complain about your life when it's not working. And the emotion that you're feeling right now is keeping you connected to the past. You never do this when your life is working. And so I don't have a problem with moving through the stages of emotions. But I also know that what a person really wants more than anything else is to be free. People want to be free. And I have witnessed transformation on every culture, on every skin color, every shape, every size, every age. I've witnessed it. And the same radiance that takes place in a person's face, a light behind their eyes, a different physical physical presentation of their face is eminent it's real and that person has worked to overcome themselves and so it's not that we shouldn't feel emotions we should feel those emotions and feel them completely and like a child get over it though and just let it out and then go when we witness people analyzing their life within some disturbing emotion on the brain scans, over and over again, we saw their brain getting worse. Just, just worse. And I would go, excuse me, Hector, what the hell were you doing in there? Oh, I was just caught up with my ex and my kids and my aunt. Well, yeah, I want you to know that that's making your brain worse. And so then when they start reasoning that, and they understand I'm not going to give them the answer to their problems because when a person is suffering, what are they looking for? They're looking for me to take them out of their suffering and I can give them the answer. The, the correct answer to their problems and they will argue against me. They will argue the entire time. No, but no, but no, but. And I don't know what I do. I, don't, I, don't, I just say, take the ride with me. Give me four days, give me five days, cross the river, get beyond yourself and get beyond that emotion. And the memory without the emotional charge is wisdom. And that's the name of the game because the soul can't go to the future, can't create a new adventure, can't journey back to source if you're living by some emotion that's keeping you in the past. The soul can't even, doesn't even know what to dream about. It can't because it's seeing the future through the lens of the past. So then when the person starts coming up against themselves and they're sitting there and you say you create your reality. All right, well, then I'm going to have a thought about what I want, but they can't control their thoughts. That's because their body's influencing their mind. So the only way they're going to begin to liberate energy is to be still and to know that they're God to be greater than their body and every time they settle it back into the present moment they're lowering the volume to that emotion and now they become the mind
and the body is no longer the mind and when the body is finally free they'll see possibilities they never saw before I've seen it too many times and all of a sudden all that person wants to do is be in the present moment and become more happy they want to, they want more of that but living in guilt or grief or shame or unworthiness I someone tell me they lost a loved one the other day and I said well okay how long have you been grieving oh about a year really okay well suppose it was you that left and you were looking at the person you love moping around for a year what would you say to them after a year if you truly love them get over it and have a happy life I'm doing great you should make yourself happy you really love me live a happy life that would be the greatest testament of love for each other because if you're suffering then I uh, you know you're making this hard on me and so then we always have to update our versions about reality because it's the only way that we adapt don't believe everything you've read or heard it just may not be the truth there's always a greater truth that you and I can begin to investigate surely someone in eternity has had a similar problems as you and I and have gotten beyond it yes or no yes. so study that person you want to be wealthy study wealthy people don't just have some panacea that you're just going to get wealthy. Read about wealthy people and find out that they lost everything and failed miserably 20, 50 times. But what they had as a, a characteristic, a quality in their personality is they were persistent and they kept changing and they kept forgiving and letting go of the past and kept going. And sooner or later they ran into it and when they had all the money they wanted, it was never about the money. It was just about that they could prove to themselves that they can do it. And you and I are no different than that. But if you can't create a future because of some emotion that keeps you in the past, you're going to have to square off with that emotion. And when you sit down and your body has all those physical sensations and it's getting vigilant and it wants to get up and it wants to move and, and you're just going, wow. And you're settling it down and you're working with it. you got to agree with me. That something greater in you is climbing out of that body. Something greater in you is awakening. And when you're able to overcome those emotions, truly break the addiction, don't you know that you'll return back to your life and face the person that betrayed you? And you will see a part of yourself that you used to be that you no longer are and you're not going to have anything else but love for them. In fact, you're going to have compassion for them because you're going to realize how stuck they are and you're liberated and free. True forgiveness is when you take your attention off somebody because you've overcome the emotion and that gives them permission to show up differently in your life because you freed yourself and you freed them. And all of a sudden, reality begins to unfold in mysterious ways and that person shows up and says, forgive me. I am I was so wrong and you're over it already and you're just like go on with it man I'm I'm in a new life I would have never been in this new life if you didn't betray me thank you the first two years of a child's life their brain waves are basically in Delta so they're asleep with their eyes open. And as they begin to interact with their environment, their brain waves change to theta. And theta is kind of like that twilight state where you have mystical experiences. But the first six years of a child's life, they're completely in their subconscious mind because that's what those brain wave patterns do. And as a result of it, all of their attention is on their inner world, feelings. So they have experiences that happen to them. And when the experience happens, they pay attention to their feelings. That's the primary modus for them. And then when they feel altered, they begin to look through their senses outside of them to see who or what caused it. And that event in and of itself is called an associative memory. So for the first six, seven, eight, nine years of our lives as our brain waves move into alpha and then ultimately into beta. Uh, when we get to beta, we're pretty much developed an analytical mind. 
And the analytical mind then serves as a filter or a barrier to separate the conscious mind from the subconscious mind. But that experience, though, is encoded in a memory system called an implicit memory system. It's stored in our subconscious. So then we don't know why we behave the way we do the rest of our lives because of events that have happened to us, but we're operating at a very fundamental level equal to the emotion that we've experienced. Another way to say that is the moment you get in situations that bring up similar emotions that have branded you from the past, you return back to that seven-year-old child. And you behave in very, very, very um, limited ways because that's all you know, right? No one ever instructed you how to, to, uh, to learn and to grow. So then people do all these psychoanalysis and they all do all these different types of therapies and a lot of times it never gets to the core of it because they never get beyond their analytical mind to make those changes. Does that make sense? So there are techniques and ways to begin to lower the volume of those emotions that literally are stored in that system. And as you begin to lower the volume of those emotions within that system, you begin to re restore the system. And the end product is called wisdom. Because a memory without the emotional charge is called wisdom, and that's how we grow and learn. Now, in the work that we've done over and over and over again, that most people, what they do is they have an emotional situation that happens in their life. Emotions are a record of the past. They analyze and think within that emotion, so they're thinking in the past. Are you with me? And when we studied their brain waves and we studied their brain functionally, when they're doing that, their brain always gets worse. Their brain gets more out of balance because it's the very, the very hormones of stress that begin to super arouse or cause the brain to become so aroused, oh, uh, uh, heightened. And when the brain is heightened, as I'll talk about this weekend, when you're facing a threat or something in your life that's potentially dangerous, the moment that happens, you begin to anchor consciousness in the body. You become very aware of your body because there's danger out there. You become super aware of objects and things in your environment because there's something dangerous out there. And you begin to obsess about time. And now when you do that, your brain waves change and all of your attention goes on the outer world because that's where the danger is. Does that make sense? So 70% of the time, people stay in this state. That's a scientific fact. So then, when we studied people in altered states, we saw that when they're analyzing their life, you know, what do I do, should I do this, should I do that, within the emotion of whatever it is that keeps them anchored to the past, they never really produce a change. But we've seen, without a doubt, over and over again, that when a person goes into an altered state, when they go within, and they become nobody, no one, no thing, no where, and no time. That's the moment they become pure consciousness. That's the moment they're no longer associating in this space and time, and they just walk through the door to the quantum field. Now, in order for you, that means that in order for you to change your body, if you have a disease, you've got to get beyond your body. <laughs> in order for you to change some aspect of your personality, you've got to get beyond the personality and its program. You've got to get beyond the someone. If you are going to create something or change something in your life, you've got to get beyond your association to known things and places in your life. And if you are going to create some novel event in some future time, you've got to get beyond the anticipation of the future based on the past. And when people actually do that, when they are pure consciousness, that's the moment the brain literally can change in a matter of seconds because now the operator is no longer immersed in matter. The operator now is beginning to manipulate matter from a different level of mind. And so people can heal their inner child by doing their inner child work, by overcoming emotions, and it requires a certain amount of consciousness and awareness. It requires a certain amount of metacognition or mindfulness to observe who they're being and begin to modify their behaviors and create new experiences and begin to overcome some of those emotions that keep them anchored to the past. But in order to do it in a very quick way, we've seen this over and over again, that people have to get beyond their body, their environment, and time. That's when they all of a sudden, consciousness becomes the epiphenomenon of matter, 
And a person can have an instantaneous experience that changes them because they're now already in the operating system. And I'll show you some brain scans that will probably floor most of you because these are not nuns, these are not Buddhist monks, these are not academics, these are not Kabbalistic rabbis. These are common people just like you doing an uncommon thing. And the amount of energy that we're capturing in their brain, we have never seen in a scientific experiment to date, which means that person has having a full on inner experience that's transcendent of any past experience. They're having such a transcendent moment that the experience in that moment is reorganizing the circuitry in their brain. And the end product of the experience is called an emotion. They're feeling awe and wonder and love and joy. And they're signaling new genes in new ways. And that's the moment the past is literally washed out of the body. And we've seen tumors change. We've seen uterine fibroids go away. We've seen anxiety, depression. We've seen MS, lupus. We've seen it change in one instant when the person literally connects that deeply to the power within them. And that's the moment that the rewiring process can happen instantaneously. Now, that doesn't always happen that way. Other times, you got to stay at it. People who have done our work have done their meditations for three years. It took them three years to heal their condition. But you know what? They wanted that healing more than their sleep. They wanted that healing more than their social engagements. They wanted that healing more than their morning coffee. They wanted that more than anything else. And they wanted to connect with the divine every single day. And they wanted to drink from a deeper well. And they said, I don't want breakfast. I don't want coffee. I don't want my cell phone. I don't want my internet. I want you, power within me. We have a date. And I am going to commune with you. And I'm going to connect with you. And there's nothing else that matters more in this moment than that. And every day they overcame a little aspect of themselves. Surrendered a piece of the limited self to join the greater self. And sure, it was hard. And sure, they had doubts. And sure, they were uncertain. And sure, they didn't feel like it certain days because they were facing a very serious condition. But every day they did it. And after a period of three years, and they overcame that disease or that condition or whatever, you ask that person, what about that condition or disease? They'll tell you, it was my greatest teacher. What about your father who was an alcoholic and was abusive? That was my greatest lesson. Because what if you think about your father now? Do you have any charge? No. And I'd say, well, now you have wisdom. Because the memory without the emotional charge is wisdom. And if the soul's job is to embrace the unknown and create new experiences, if we're living by the same emotions, addicted to those emotions every day, how can the soul go on an adventure into the future if it is stuck emotionally to the past? So then positive thinking doesn't work if the person is literally anchored to the past emotionally. And so when people begin to open their hearts, and Greg will talk about this and I'll talk about it, and we've, we've got enormous amount of data to show how powerful you are and how connected you are to the person on the other side of the room when you open your heart, how it affects that person. We've measured this, that you are bound in an invisible field beyond space and time, but not when you're feeling anxious, not when you're feeling angry, not when you're feeling frustrated, not when you're judgmental. You're not doing that. You're actually drawing from the field around your body and turning it into chemistry, and your field shrinks. But when you open your heart, and you begin to breathe through that center and it's safe to open up, the field around your body can be nine meters wide. That's science now. Now you're more energy and less matter. And that non-local phenomenon begins to have an effect on everybody that you've ever interacted with. So then we know that when people begin to unmemorize those emotional states and they lower the volume to them, the emotion is what's signaling the gene in the wrong way. And if the emotion is a record of the past, the moment the person overcomes that emotion, they're free now to create a new future. And according to the religious model, they're born again in the same life.
we have a power in our mind which is able to control what is happening in the uh, in our body uh, are we able to go 100 in into 100 percent power of our own brain the seat of the mind we are through the power of the will and intention i i thought to do things thought of impossible yeah and uh, like climbing mount everest in your shorts if you know how to control it you know how to control the extremes coming to you not making you paranoid or uh, full of anxiety you are able to tap in and to find even the way where nothing is visible three hours later i found myself in a, a advanced base camp at 20,000 feet uh, uh, received by tibetans who saw a man in shorts coming out of the snow <laughs> must be the yeti right. or the snowman or the ice man but actually it's the power of the mind which led me intuitively to the right place so if you are able to do that uh, uh, and you find yourself then we are able to do a whole lot more I went into the deepest, I activated it while being stressfully exposed to ice water on the skin. And normally you cannot do nothing. There's no breathing in the brain scan. You cannot move, it's nothing. Only you can use the power of your own brain, of your mind. And it showed I was making the skin temperature not going down while being exposed to ice water. Mm. So then they looked inside the brain and then uh, they saw on the surface the thinking brain, the prefrontal cortex, the conscious brain, our thought thinking brain, go into the deepest part of the brain and robustly activating. So the, if you are able to go into the deepest, then you have done them all. You can go anywhere. And that is now the question. We are on the threshold of the power of the mind being accessible for every human mm. in the world. When the first time people broke the record by going uh, 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 below uh, 10 seconds, the next year 15 people could do it. It's morphology. Mm. We are connected. We only need to have this conviction now and this belief uh, uh, based on science. Hey, uh, guys, you are able to take over the power of your own brain it's here just invest into that and not invest into not being able to do that hmm. we become immortal by understanding through the power of our own brain to connect with the soul and because that sounds like hippie bullshit that's why i go through science right I take the brain surgeons, I take uh, the neurologists, the, the immunologists, the biochemical professors, and hey, I challenge any scientist in the world, prove me wrong. Yeah. I think uh, we are here, uh, here on this earth to prove that the soul is able to go through our conscious brain mm -hmm. and become manifested. And, uh, so, uh, and that is the core. If we stay at the core, we grow into it. But no, this world is about, uh, you got to serve the system. You got to serve the, uh, the system who creates wars and stress and diseases and things that is normal and we cannot do anything. No, we can do all. We can bring peace and power to ourselves to become happy, strong and healthy. And with that, the purpose of our lives the soul itself we are able to become happy what else do you want right you don't want six cars or te te 10 houses and uh, uh, so many uh, other things to compensate the loss of your security and scarcity because you are happy because you feel whole because also you have, you're healthy and you're strong you're vibrant also as well yes so you're not you're not trying to necessarily have to take from somebody else or put anybody else down if you have eaten you are no hungry anymore True. If you are happy, you don't seek for compensation. Right. You're there and you emanate love.
When I, when I interviewed you five years ago, I started doing the cold showers every morning. The most popular episode that we have in our show is my morning routine. And we always get people commenting on cold showers because they love everything else, but the cold showers is difficult. Where do people start with that, do you recommend? Uh, they don't have to do like a 10 minutes in the beginning. No, 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 I have 30 seconds at the most. Don't go shockingly around with your physiology, with your body. No, right. no shocking. It's just 30 seconds cold. And know that you are able to use the power of your mind. That we have a power in our mind which is able to control what is happening in, the, in our body. It's called interoceptive focus. Mm -hmm. And you learn, you can learn that uh, right away. If your house is on fire, you run fast. You don't need no nothing, no trigger. Right. So that, that is a control of the adrenaline and it's empowered by the adrenal axis and it's moved inside of our brain. So if you learn to go into that part of the brain, you learn not only to go into the cold shower, you learn the power of your brain, mm. of your mind to co learn to control. Once you learn to control to go into the cold shower, the cold is only a mirror for, uh, uh, and it's good for your vascular system. It's a teacher. But the mind is being exercised. And that mind is then very much more able to oppose stress in daily life, in your business meetings, mm. in your deadlines, in this and that. Because it's all about the physiology connected to the brain. Right. And you are in control. Now we have three brains that allow us to go from thinking to doing to being. Now the first brain, the neocortex, <clears throat> it's the newest brain in evolution. It's that walnut shaped structure that sits on the outside with all of its folds and valleys in yellow there. It's the newest, the most evolved and highly specialized in human beings. Right under the neocortex is called the limbic brain, the chemical brain the emotional brain or the mammalian brain. It's about the size of a lemon and it's responsible for regulating internal chemical order. Right in the back of the brain stem there in, in red is called the cerebellum, the reptilian brain. It's the oldest brain in evolution. It's the seat of the subconscious mind. Now your brain is made up of about a hundred billion neurons. If you took a hundred billion sheets of paper and stacked them on top of each other, it would be 5,000 miles high. That's the distance from Los Angeles to London. Now, nerve cells possess the unique ability to store and communicate information between each other. So your neocortex, your thinking brain, is the seat of your conscious awareness. You're listening to me right now with your neocortex. And what the neocortex loves to do is to gather information. And every time you learn something new, you make a new synaptic connection in your thinking brain. That's what learning is. Learning is forging new connections. And every time you learn something new, your brain physically changes. So you read a book on how to ride a bicycle, you read a book on how to build a doghouse, you read a book on how to dance the salsa, how to cook French cuisine, how to become successful, how to be a better parent. And your brain literally upscales its, upscales its hardware to reflect a new level of mind. The principle in neuroscience says this, nerve cells that fire together, wire together. And as you begin to learn new information, you biologically wire that information into your cerebral architecture. So if learning is making new synaptic connections, then remembering is maintaining and sustaining those connections. And just like any relationship, the more you communicate, the more bonded you become. And neurons are exactly the same way. Now once these neurons begin to fire and wire together, they actually form networks, what neuroscientists call neural networks. Now neural networks are just gangs of neurons that have fired and wired together to form a community of neurosynaptic connections. It could be related to an idea, a concept, a memory, experience, 
a skill or behavior or an action. So you generate more electrical impulses in your brain in one day than all the cell phones on the planet put together. Now the neuroscientific definition of mind is mind is the brain in action. Mind is the brain at work. Mind is what the brain does. And because we have a hundred billion neurons seamlessly pieced together, we can make the brain fire in different sequences, different patterns, and different combinations. And whenever we make the brain work differently, we're changing our mind. Now, when you're in the midst of an experience, everything you're seeing and smelling and tasting and feeling and hearing, all of your five senses are gathering this vital information from the environment. And as you begin to process all this information and it's rushing back to your brain, jungles of neurons begin to organize themselves into patterns. So experience then enriches the circuitry in your brain neurologically, but then it produces a chemical that's released in the second brain called the limbic brain or the emotional brain. So you can remember your first kiss. You can remember graduating from college. You can remember the birth of your first child. You can remember finishing a marathon. You can remember catching a fish off the coast of Mexico and then taking it home and cooking it and drinking some really good wine that tastes good and feeling the ocean breeze on your face and seeing the sunset. And we could say that you were altered from that experience. The problem is you can't remember what you had for dinner the night before. That's because routine lulls the brain to sleep. Now, stress is when your body's knocked out of homeostasis. Stress is when your body's knocked out of balance. Now, when you see a lion, you begin to turn on a primitive nervous system. But it doesn't even have to be your lion, a lion. You could see your mother-in-law, and it produces the same exact effect. You can begin to think about certain things and auto-suggest, and you can turn on the stress response just by thought alone. Now, your body is your unconscious mind. It does not know the difference between the actual experience in reality that produces the emotion and the emotion that you fabricate by thought alone. To the body, it believes it's in that experience. So the moment the limbic brain begins to make a blend of neuropeptides, it begins to signal the hormonal centers, and you get a rush of energy to prepare you for this event, real or imagined. The moment that happens, you become altered in some way. The fight or flight nervous system causes your pre-pupils to dilate, your mouth gets a little dry, all of a sudden your heart rate begins to change, your respiratory rate changes, and blood is being sent to your extremities. And now you're prepared to either do battle with your mother-in-law or never go to the dinner. You begin to think about what you were thinking about. You begin to pay attention to how you're reacting you begin to notice how you're feeling. And that concept in neuroscience is called metacognition. We can observe who we're being. And because we can observe who we're being, it means we could modify our behaviors to do a better job in life. So now the frontal lobe is the seat of your awareness. It's the home of the you and the me. And as you begin to think about who you no longer want to be, the frontal lobe acts like a volume control and it begins to lower the volume in the circuits in your brain that are connected to the old self. And as it begins to silence those circuits that are connected to the old level of mind, that level of mind no longer fires and you're observing it instead of participating in it. And as you begin to silence those circuits, nerve cells that no longer fire together no longer wired together and you begin to biologically break down the circuits in your brain that are connected to the old self and to the old mind and as you begin to plan your actions and you begin to think about a new way of being and you begin to put yourself into the equation your brain naturally begins to fire in new sequences and new patterns and new combinations and whenever you make your brain work differently you're changing your mind because mind is the brain in action and as the brain begins to fire in new ways and you produce a new level of mind nerve cells that fire together wire together and you begin to install the neurological hardware ahead of the actual experience 
and now you have circuits in place to use when you get into that dinner. So now, as you ask yourself, what is compassion, and you begin to remember all these different things that you learned in the book, the frontal lobe, like a great symphony leader, begins to synchronize these circuits. And when it begins to produce a certain level of coherence, a certain level of mind, your brain naturally creates a hologram or an image. And that image then becomes the internal representation of what you are going to use when you walk into that dinner. We would call that intention. You begin to think about who you do want to be based on the knowledge you've learned and you're priming your brain ahead of the actual experience. You walk into the dinner and you get your behaviors to match your intentions. You get your actions equal to your thoughts. You get your mind and body working together and you do exactly what the book says. The moment that happens, all of a sudden you feel compassion. Now, the moment your heart begins to open and you feel compassion, you are teaching your body emotionally to understand what your mind intellectually understood. And you're changing the fabric of you because you're instructing your body chemically to understand what your mind is intellectually and philosophically understood. But it's not enough to do it once. You can't forgive your mother-in-law one time and expect to be on the stained glass windows in church. You got to be able to repeat the experience. You got to be able to do it over and over again. You have to do it so many times that you no longer have to think about it. And when you do it over and over again, you neurochemically condition the body to memorize compassion as well as the conscious mind. And when that happens, when the mind and body are working together, or the body knows as well as the mind, you activate that third brain called the cerebellum. And so the way we transform the world is we transform ourselves. And when we're in that state of being, we give people permission to do the same. Thanks for listening. They're priming their brain and beginning to lay down the circuitry for them to think in different ways. It's a process of repatterning. It's a process of rewiring. It's a process of reconditioning. It's a process of self-reflection and awareness and changing those beliefs. So by creating something for people to utilize that you're not relying on so many things outside of you to bring you joy or you know this kind of subconscious program of being a victim you say Brian why are you so upset today well I'm upset because of this person or this thing what that really means is is that some person or some condition in your environment is controlling the way you're feeling and the way you're thinking well, if, you're, if something is outside of you is controlling the way you feel and the way you think, you're a victim to your environment. And so then there is this dramatic polarity that goes on. When things are going well, you're happy. When things aren't going well, you're sad. But when you learn how to self-regulate and create more coherence in your brain and heart, and that's what, we, we're, that's what our message is, then you're no longer dependent on your outer world controlling your mood, in fact, you begin to realize how you think and feel begins to produce effects in your outer life. Now you start believing more you're the creator of your life and less of the victim of your life. Now that isn't something that you take one bite of and swallow and it's all over. It's a process of repatterning. It's a process of rewiring. It's a process of reconditioning. It's a process of self-reflection and awareness and changing those beliefs. And that's the work. And yet people are doing it. So when you begin to realize then, well, I can't respond to the same conditions in my life with the same emotions and the same thoughts, because if I believe that the way I feel and the way I think creates reality, if I'm reacting 
to the same thoughts and feelings equal to the conditions in my life in the same way, then I keep reaffirming the same life. So then a person has to retreat from their life, retreat from their environment, disconnect from their outer world, and begin to lay down patterns neurologically in their brain so that their brain is no longer a record of the past. They're priming their brain and beginning to lay down the circuitry for them to think in different ways, to begin to close their eyes and rehearse who they're going to be in that day. And the act of mentally rehearsing begins to install the neurological hardware in their brain so their brain looks like the experience is already happening or has already happened. Now the brain's no longer a record of the past. Now we're creating a map to the future. Now It's if, practicing gratitude before it happens. Well, now the emotion. Those, right. Now, so then the action of rehearsal and installing the neurological hardware by firing and wiring the same circuitry, the hardware becomes a software program, which means you're going to start automatically acting like a different person. You're going to start automatically thinking in new ways. And then to trade guilt or anxiety or aggression or hatred or anger, to say those are emotions of the past and as long as I live by these emotions, those emotions are influencing my thoughts. If emotions are a record of the past, then I'm thinking in the past, so my past is going to be my future. So if I want to be wealthy, I can't bring lack. If I want to be happy, I can't bring pain. Well. So then let's get beyond the emotion. So by trading those limited survival emotions and teaching people how to elevate their emotional state and really measure to tell them you're doing it or you're not doing it. When you teach your body emotionally what that future is going to feel like and you say I'm not going to get up until I feel this feeling and I'm locked into that feeling. Well the, the side effect of that is let's just say that you can contact the emotions of your future and you teach your body what it feels like emotionally the joy the gratitude the appreciation the love for life the joy for existence the inspiration and you know most people do that in the beginning they feel kind of funny like why am i doing this because they've been hypnotized and conditioned to need a reason to feel that right. something outside of them has got to change how they feel inside of them so they spend their whole life in lack and emptiness waiting for it to happen but living in lack isn't going to create it so you're front loading it and that feels weird at first at first right. at first but if you start understanding what you're doing and why you're doing it and the stronger the emotion you feel the more you're going to pay attention to the picture in your mind you begin to remember your future. You are branding that circuitry in your brain and now you're emotionally conditioning your body into the future. Now here's the side effect of that. If you can do that properly and become familiar with those states of mind and body and you get up feeling like your future has already happened, I guarantee you you're going to stop looking for it. I guarantee you you're going to stop analyzing why, it's going, why it hasn't happened. You're going to feel like it has already happened. Now. The work is to be able to maintain that modified state of mind and body your entire day. You got to be able to sustain that state independent of your coworkers, independent of your boss, independent of your ex, independent of your finances, independent of your the traffic. And if you're able to do that, you will begin to see the feedback in your life. In a sense, when energy makes it to the heart, it begins to broaden the field around the body, an energy that's literally measurable, a magnetic field. And that energy is a frequency. And that frequency can carry the thought of your health, of your wealth, of your freedom, of your new relationship, of your new job. The frequency or the emotion of suffering can't carry the thought of health. It can't carry the thought of your new future. So then when there's a vibrational match between the energy, because we're always emitting energy and information, when there's a vibrational match between your energy and some possibility that exists in the quantum field, something magical happens because once energy makes it to your heart, you're creating from the field instead of from matter. Now this weird thing starts to happen and things start coming to you. Now you don't have to rush anywhere to get it. You're not creating a matter to matter from three-dimensional reality to three-dimensional reality. That takes time. You're creating from the field and it's the field that creates matter. So all of a sudden you start seeing things coming to you. When you see that, and you start to see that they're coming in unusual ways that surprise you, uh, you're going to begin to wake up to the fact that you're probably more the creator of your life and less of the victim of your life. So teaching people how to do that and then be able to become studious, 
to become the scientist in their life to measure the effects of them at cause. Whatever's going on in the news, whatever's going on in the media, whatever's going on, uh, it doesn't, it, it, it's incidental to the fact that now they're beginning to make great strides. So when people come, you know, for all kinds of reasons to our work, you know, they come for to get healthy, they come to get wealthy, they come to have a relationship, they come for a mystical experience. But I now know they really come for wholeness. And when you feel so whole because your brain is so orderly and so coherent, and you've trained your heart to be more in coherence, and you feel that kind of joy for no reason at all. <laughs> this is where it gets interesting, because now, all of a sudden, you're, you're, you're no longer seduced uh, by the conditions in your outer world. In fact, you're seeing the hidden meaning behind everything because you're viewing it from a greater level of consciousness. Right. So sitting in the fire of your guilt sitting in the fire of your pain and knowing what to do when that happens and teaching people that as they begin to lower the volume to those emotions, as they begin to self-regulate, that's the greatest challenge they have in their, uh, in their lives. I mean, people say to me, what do you do in the morning? Well, two hours in the morning, that's a lot of time. Well, if I can overcome myself at the beginning of the day, the rest of my day is easy. And right? that's what you do. You spend two hours in the morning. I allow for two hours. Okay. You I'll, still get up at 4 a.m. and that Well, this morning time? I was up at 3. Okay. <laughs> because I'm on the wrong time zone. Right. But, but if I'm like, up. You like the 4 a.m. slot. Because my brain waves are just right. I don't have to work as hard. Yeah, my body's a little fatigued, but I'm between worlds. And so I've just, I, I, you know, my body's a little tired, but I get up and do it. And to me, I allow for two hours. Sometimes I can nail it in 45 minutes or an hour and sure, I'm done. Other times... I'm on the wrong time zone, I have meetings all day long, I got a lot going on, and I'm just not gonna fall prey to that common state of thinking. And that looks like meditation, affirmations in your mind, visualization? It's, it's the work that we do. It's okay. the work that we do. And the first part in truly creating a new personal reality is overcoming your present personality. <laughs> you gotta get beyond the normal thinking patterns, the normal urges of action and habits to get beyond certain emotions that are residuals from the day before. That's the work right there. That's the part you have to overcome. So some days you just kind of slip in and it's magic because you've been practicing like having a great golf game or a great tennis game or a great run or, or, or a great session of knitting. You're just, you're in your groove. Other days you got to work a little bit more for it. And for me, what I've learned is those hard days, the days that are the most challenging, are always the most rewarding. Mm -hmm. Because now you're uncompromising to an outcome. And if it takes you an hour to get beyond yourself, to find the present moment, because that's the only place where the unknown exists, the familiar emotions and hardwired patterns of the past, are the known, the predictable future in trying to forecast the feeling of every event in our life, what people do unconsciously is also the known. There's only one place where the unknown exists and that's the present moment. You so, call it the generous present moment. Yeah, and I've just done it enough times and there are plenty of people in our work that have done it enough times to know when you're there and when you're not. Okay. And when you're not, it's very obvious because you, you've been there enough times. So. So you're separating your old story from yourself and you're separating your focus on the future and you're being present. It's just like hitting a tennis ball in a sweet spot. Okay. You lock into something and that wholeness starts to happen and now you're no longer creating from polarity or duality or opposites, you know. Like, you know, people, you know, people, they create when they see they don't have something. Whether, hey, nice suit, I want one of those, right? In the moment I see that you have a nice suit and I start thinking, I want one of those, my brain naturally starts putting me in the equation. Next thing you know, I'm wearing your suit. Well, that's because we're wired to do that. So then we have this natural ability to create. The problem is, is after you imagine that, you open your eyes and you don't have it, people experience more lack. Well, we're not that good yet. <laughs> so then the act of practicing enough times and beginning to create the state in which you're so connected to the energy of your future. Now think about this. 
You're so connected to the energy of your future, you're no longer looking for it or waiting for it. You feel like it's already happened. The moment you get upset in traffic, the moment you start judging a coworker, you just disconnected from the energy of your future, and now you're back to the energy of your past. Now, <laughs> if you tell me it was that person that did it to you, I'd say to you, oh, you're back to the unconscious program of being a victim again. So then the person then goes, oh, when did I fall from you know, that state? When did I lose it? Oh, it happened at three o'clock today. The next time that happens, what can I do differently? Now the person's moving through their challenges in their life with coherence, with rhythm. They're starting to begin to make strides and that they're no longer knee-jerking to the people in their life that, that they've used emotionally to reaffirm their identity. Well, I've interviewed a, hundreds and hundreds of people that have healed themselves from all kinds of health conditions. And one of the most important elements uh, that I see over and over again is when the person said, I just got to this point in my life where I made up my mind. And they made a decision with such firm intention that the amplitude of that decision carried a level of energy that was greater than the hardwired programs in their brain and the emotional conditioning in their body to the past. And their body responded to their mind in that instant. And the stronger the emotion or the stronger the intensity of that energy, the stronger they felt that energy, they came out of the resting state, the more they paid attention to the choice they were making. Right. So and, like the decision might be, I'm not gonna let my ex-wife bother me anymore. I'm gonna no longer or get had, angry. Yeah, or, we had a woman on the stage in our event just recently, 78-year-old woman, very serious car accident, in a wheelchair, couldn't walk, couldn't speak. Made up her mind, like, this is it. I am here to change. It wasn't like 50% in, I hope this works. She was like, I made up my mind. And the decision became a, a moment in time that she never forgot. She will say to you, I know the moment I made up my mind. I know the moment I decided to change. That, think about it. That is the moment she moved her brain and body from the past present reality into a future present reality. What do I mean by that? People wake up in the morning and they, they don't feel anything. And all of a sudden, their brain is a record of the past. They start thinking about all their problems. And those problems are memories of certain people and objects and things at certain times and places. So the moment they start remembering their problems, they're thinking in the past. Well, every one of those problems has an emotion associated with it. So they start feeling unhappy, they start feeling discouraged, they start feeling victimized. Now their body's in the past. And if how you think and how you feel creates your state of being, that person's starting their day with their entire state of being in the past. So if they're living in the familiar past and they're in the known, they're gonna create the predictable future. So they're going to run through a series of routine behaviors in their day and they're going to want to know the feeling of every experience in their life. Well, if you can predict the feeling of every experience in your life, that's more of the known. So now, the person who's now living in that future known reality, how are they going to change? Well, the moment you make a decision and you come out of your resting state and you begin to say, this, I don't care what's going on in my life, environment. I don't care what people think, environment. I don't care how I feel, body. I don't care how long it takes time. I'm gonna do this. And the hair on the back of your neck stands up. That's a new electrochemical signal to the body. This is the body saying he's serious this time. It's no longer, oh geez, I think I'm gonna change tomorrow. Right. This, is a, this is a strong signal. And that becomes a long-term memory. That moment defines the person. So then the stronger the emotion, if the, if the emotion of inspiration is greater than the emotion of suffering from the past experience, the stronger the emotion they feel, the more they pay attention to the picture in their mind. We could say they're remembering their future and they're beginning to brand that circuitry in their brain and send a new emotional signature to their body. And in a sense, they're creating a coherent, clear intention with an elevated, coherent, hard emotion. And now they're broadcasting a whole new signature. And that's dropping a big stone in a very placid lake. And here come the waves. That's moving right out into reality. And the person is beginning to change their energy. And nobody, nobody changes until they change their energy.
people wake up in the morning, uh, they begin to think about their problems. Those problems are circuits of memories in the brain. Each one of those memories are connected to people and things at certain times and places. And if the brain is a record of the past, the moment they start their day, they're already thinking in the past. Each one of those memories has an emotion. Emotions are the end product of past experiences. So the moment they recall those memories of their problems, they all of a sudden feel unhappy, they feel sad, they feel pain. Now, how you think and how you feel creates your state of being. So the person's entire state of being when they start their day is in the past. So what does that mean? The familiar past will sooner or later be predictable future. So if you believe that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny and you can't think greater than how you feel, or feelings have become the means of thinking, by very definition of emotions, you're thinking in the past. And for the most part, you're gonna keep creating the same life. So then people grab their cell phone, they check their WhatsApp, they check their texts, they check their emails, they check Facebook, they take a picture of their feet, they post it on Facebook, they tweet something, they do Instagram, uh, they check the news, and now they feel really connected to everything that's known in their life. And then they go through a series of routine behaviors. They get out of bed on the same side, they go to the toilet, they get a cup of coffee, they take a shower, they get dressed, they drive to work the same way, they do the same things, they see the same people, they push the same emotional buttons, and that becomes the routine, and it becomes like a program. So now they've lost their free will to a program, and there's no unseen hand doing it to them. So when it comes time to change, the re redundancy of that cycle becomes a subconscious program. So now, 95% of who we are by the time we're 35 years old is a memorized set of behaviors, emotional reactions, unconscious habits, hardwired attitudes, beliefs, and perceptions that function like a computer program. So then, a person can say with their 5% of their conscious mind, I want to be healthy, I want to be happy, I want to be free. But the body's on a whole different program. So then, how do you begin to make those changes? Well you have to get beyond the analytical mind because what separates the conscious mind from the subconscious mind is the analytical mind. And that's where meditation comes in because you can teach people through practice how to change their brain waves, slow them down. And when they do that properly, they do enter the operating system where they can begin to make some really important changes. So um, most people then wait for crisis or trauma or disease or diagnosis, you know, they wait for loss. Uh, some tragedy to make up their mind to change and my message is why wait and and you can learn and change in a state of pain and suffering or you can learn and change in a state of joy and inspiration I think right now the cool thing is that people are waking up most people spend 70 percent of their life living in survival and living in stress so they're they're always anticipating the worst case scenario based on a past experience and they're literally out of the infinite potentials in the quantum field, they're selecting the worst possible outcome and they're beginning to emotionally embrace it with fear and they're conditioning their body into a state of fear. Do that enough times, the body has a panic attack without you. you. You can't even predict it because it's programmed subconsciously. So people become addicted to the rush of those emotions and they use the problems and conditions in their life to reaffirm their limitation so at least they can feel something. So now when it comes time to change, you say to the person, why are you this way? Well, every time they recall the event, they're producing the same chemistry in their brain and body as if the event is occurring. Firing and wiring the same circuits and sending the same emotional signature to the body. Well, what's the relevance behind that? Well, your body is your unconscious mind. In a sense, if you're sitting down and you start thinking about uh, some future worst case scenario that you're conjuring up in your mind and you begin to feel the emotion of that event your body doesn't know the difference between the event that's taking place in your world outer world and what you're creating by emotion or thought alone so most people then they're they're constantly reaffirming their emotional states so when it comes time to give up that emotion they can say I really want to do it but really the body is stronger than the mind because it's been conditioned that way. So the servant now has become the master and the person all of a sudden, once they step into that unknown, they'd rather feel guilt and suffering because at least they can predict it. Being in the unknown 
is a scary place for most people because the unknown is uncertain. You know, people say to me, well, I can't predict my future. I'm in the unknown and I always say the best way to predict your future is to create it. Not from the known, but from the unknown. What thoughts do you want to fire and wire in your brain? What behaviors do you want to demonstrate in one day? The act of rehearsing the mentally, closing your eyes and rehearsing the action. The rehearsing the reaction of what you want? or the Yeah, action the action of what you want. By closing your eyes and mentally rehearsing some action. If you're truly present, the brain does not know the difference between what you're imaging and what you're experiencing in 3D world. So then you begin to install the neurological hardware in your brain to look like the event has already occurred. Now, your brain is no longer a record of the past. Now it's a map to the future. And if you keep doing it, priming it that way, the hardware becomes a software program. And who knows, you just may start acting like a happy person. And then I think the, the hardest part is to teach our body emotionally what the future will feel like ahead of the actual experience. So what does that mean? You can't wait for your success to feel empowered. You can't wait for your wealth to feel abundant. You can't wait for your, your new relationship to feel love or uh, uh, your healing to feel whole. I mean, that's the old model of reality of cause and effect, you know, waiting for something outside of us to change how we feel inside of us. And when we feel better inside of us, we pay attention to whoever or whatever caused it. But what that means then is that from the Newtonian world is that most people spend their whole life living in lack, waiting for something to change out there. What do you mean the Newtonian world? The Newtonian world is all about the predictable. It's all about predicting the future. But the quantum model of reality is, is about causing an effect. The moment you start feeling abundant and worthy, you are generating wealth. The moment you're empowered and feel it, you're beginning to step towards your success. The moment you start feeling whole, your healing begins. And when you love yourself and you love all of life, you'll create an equal. And now you're causing an effect. And I think that's the, the difference between living as a victim in your world saying, I am this way because of this person or that thing or this experience. They made me think and feel this way. When you switch that around, you become a creator of your world and you start saying, my thinking and my feeling is changing an outcome in my life. And now that's a whole different game and we start believing more that we're creators of reality. And most people, uh, when they have a thought, they just think that that's the truth. And I think one of my greatest realizations in my own journey was just because you have a thought doesn't necessarily mean it's true. So if you think 60 to 70,000 thoughts in one day, and we do, and 90% of those thoughts are the same thoughts as the day before, and you believe that your thoughts have something to do with your destiny, your life's not gonna change very much because the same thought leads to the same choice, the same choice leads to the same behavior, the same behavior creates the same experience, and the same experience produces the same emotion. And so then, the act of becoming conscious of this process to to begin to become more aware of how you think, how you act, and how you feel. It's called metacognition. And so then, why is that important? Because the more conscious you become of those unconscious states of mind and body, the less likely you're gonna go unconscious during the day. And that thought is not gonna slip by your awareness unchecked because you're, it means to know thyself. And the word meditation means to become familiar with. I started becoming fascinated with the idea that you can give someone a sugar pill, a saline injection, or perform some false surgery or treatment, and a certain percentage of those people will accept, believe, and surrender to the thought that they're getting the actual substance or treatment and they begin to program their autonomic nervous system to make the exact pharmacy of chemicals equal to the substance that they think they're taking. So then it begs the question, is it the inert placebo that's doing the healing or is it the body's innate capacity to heal by thought alone? Because that pill is a symbol of possibility. All it is is a symbol. The doctor says, this is a great new drug that's gonna help with depression and the person begins to think about the idea that they could get better. They're selecting a new potential in the quantum field. And then all of a sudden, a certain percentage of those people will get enthusiastic and theos, filled with God, inspired, optimistic. They start changing their emotional state. They're combining a clear intention with an elevated emotion, and they're changing their state of being. And all of a sudden now, I began to realize, you need the sugar pill, 
Do you need the saline injection? Or can you teach a person, instead of putting their faith and belief in something exogenous outside of them, uh, that would do the healing to change their state of being? Can they just select the new potential in the quantum field instead of focusing on an unknown, focus on an unknown and revisit that unknown every single day until it becomes a known. And all of a sudden, you'll see people's depression go away, their anxiety go away, and they're not using the placebo any longer. They're healing by changing their internal states. The person doesn't need the exogenous or external substance. They can move into a state of being without it. So I thought, once I understood the mechanics of the placebo, I could teach this process even better, and in fact, you can. You know, you can't do a study right now, any drug-related study without having a triple-blind placebo test. And placebos, just so you know, work any, they range from working anywhere from 10% to 100%. Imagine that. So, in a depression study, as an example, 83% or 81% of the people in a depression study that are given a placebo heal as well as the people that are given the actual antidepressants. Now, <laughs> there's brain scans to show changes in their brain before and after. It means then they're making their own pharmacy of antidepressants by thought alone. And it took them six weeks, eight weeks of taking that placebo every single day. Now this is an important point because most people think, oh, I did, I did the exercise or the meditation once and my conditions should go away. Well, even in the depression study, six to eight weeks of taking the placebo. Every time they take the placebo, they remind themselves that they're gonna get better change their emotional state, sooner or later that becomes their new state of being, may take people six to eight weeks of doing the work every single day where they start noticing significant changes in their health. So I'm a pragmatist and if you're telling me something that's science-based, the question that I ask is how am I going to apply this to my life? So as people begin to gather this information, I now know that Every time we learn something new, we're making new connections in our brain. That's what learning is. If people can understand the understanding of the new sciences, quantum physics, neuroscience, neuroendocrinology, psychoneuroimmunology, the mind-body connection, epigenetics, all of those sciences point the finger at possibility. And if I can instruct them in a way that they begin to piece together the model, when I feel like they are at a certain point where the comprehension is right, if they can turn to the person next to them and explain it in the workshop. If they can't explain it, it's not wired in their brain. But if they can explain it, they're beginning to install the neurological hardware in their brain in preparation for an experience. So then if I can set up the conditions in the environment and give them the proper instruction and, and allow them to surrender enough into the present moment, a certain percentage of those people are going to get their behaviors to match their intentions. And when they do, they're going to experience something new. And the experience then is going to produce an emotion and they're going to feel unlimited and they're going to feel whole, they're going to feel invincible. The moment they feel that emotion, now they're teaching their body chemically to understand what their mind is intellectually understood. Now they're embodying the truth of that philosophy by initiating it, which means if you've done it once, you'll be able to do it again. You can repeat the experience over and over again. You'll begin to neurochemically condition your mind and body to begin to work as one. When you've done something so many times that your body now knows how to do it as well as your mind, now you're mastering that philosophy and now you're in a new state of being. So we have to go from, from philosopher to initiate to master, from thinking to doing to being. And once you get to that point where it now becomes innate in you, becomes who you are, then you've memorized an internal state independent of the conditions in your external environment. That's when you begin to master your environment or master your life. I call somebody up on the stage with, that was diagnosed with breast cancer, colon cancer, diagnosed with esophageal cancer, I can go down the list, and they stand on the stage and they tell their story. And it's not that they look like a movie star, sports figure, they're not all buff, they're not all young, they're not all beautiful. They're just a common person. When you hear the story, how they did it, you hear about their past, you realize what initiated the disease, and then you... Emotional trauma, maybe. Emotional trauma, one trauma. 
or two traumas, and then how they had to overcome the emotions from their past. Now think about this. The latest research in epigenetics says that it's the environment that signals the gene. Genes are like Christmas tree lights, they're turning on and off all the time. Genes make proteins, and proteins are responsible for the structure and function of your body. The expression of proteins is the expression of life. But if you're interpreting your environment the same way every single day, you're thinking the same thoughts, demonstrating the same behaviors, living by the same emotions, you keep the same genes on and the other genes off. Throw in the hormones of stress, which really down-regulates genes to create disease. Then as the question is, if the environment signals the gene and the end product of an experience in your environment is called an emotion, if you live by the same emotions every single day, your body's believing it's in the same past environmental experience over and over again, and now you're headed for a genetic destiny. So then, can you signal the gene ahead of the environment? And the answer is absolutely yes. Because when you begin to embrace an elevated emotion and you combine it with a clear intention, and you're totally in the present moment. Your brain and body don't know the difference between what's going on out there and what's going on in here. Your body believes it's in some experience in the external environment that's producing that emotion. And all of a sudden, the stronger the emotion you feel from an inward process, the more you pay attention to the thought or the image in your mind, you're creating a long-term memory. And all of a sudden now, you begin to downregulate the gene for disease and you begin to upregulate the gene for health and that gene begins to make a new protein and that protein begins to make a new hormone or a new chemical or, or, or an expression of, a, of, of something a new chemical that, that's going to begin to affect other systems in the body. So, and that's what happens on stage. There's a lot of energy in the room. No, this, that's what of... happens when a person finally breaks through. Right, and that can so, happen. That, well, that could, could happen in our event, but it could be a person who it took them two years to do it. Right. But the evidence suggests that's, acute that's... conditions our medicine is so great for acute conditions. You break your arm, you have appendicitis, you're not going to go to an acupuncturist. You're going to get immediate care. Chronic conditions require a lifestyle change, which means you have to start making different choices. You've got to start examining the way you live your life and the choices you make and the thoughts you think and, and how you manage your emotions. So the beauty behind all of this is that just like infection spreads amongst the community and creates disease. Once people start breaking through and they wrap their mind around this, health and wellness can be as infectious as disease and we're seeing it happen. The moment you start feeling grateful, <laughs> your, your healing begins. The moment you start feeling worthy and abundant, you're generating wealth. The moment you start feeling whole, you know, your healing's beginning. The moment you're in love with yourself and you're in love with life, you're going to create some pretty important relationships and now you're causing an effect so don't get up from your meditation until you feel connected to your future and then maintain that modified state of mind and body your entire day just independent of your boss your co-workers traffic independent of your indigestion independent of your pain in your hip independent of how long it's just stay there and if you're able to maintain that modified state of mind and body your entire day get ready because weird and crazy stuff are going to begin to come to you in ways that you would never expect. That's the unknown. That's the quantum now. That's feedback from your environment telling you that you are connected to that intelligence. I'm starting to realize how conditioned we are into believing how limited we are. And as you start peeling those layers away and you break through those beliefs, those self-limiting thoughts and emotions, on the other side of that is where the miraculous happens. I think this is a time in history where it's not enough to know. And because of technology, we have access to so much content and information creates awareness. And awareness is consciousness. And in an age of information, ignorance is a choice. There's an energetic change, I think, that's taking place in the world right now where people are so informed that old models, old paradigms are beginning to break down, whether it's the medical model or the religious model, the educational model, journalism, the economy, you know, um, 
politics, it's all beginning to come to the surface because something else has to come out. And 10 years ago, information was the thing that stimulated thought, stimulated new ideas. And, and as we learn new things, we make new connections in our brains. So as we begin to add new stitches into that three-dimensional tapestry in our mind, we're beginning to cause our mind to function in new ways. But the key then is to apply it. You just gotta understand the formula. Body emotionally, before the evidence takes place in their life, is breaking a significant habit. So instead of living by cause and effect, now we're beginning to cause an effect. So the moment you start feeling whole and grateful, we now know your healing will begin at that moment. The moment you start feeling worthy and abundant, your wealth is coming. Frustrated, why are you so resentful? The moment you ask that, their brain is gonna associate that emotion to a past event. That's because they have nothing to look forward to in their future. So if you're not being defined by a vision of the future, it just means to me that you're more in love with your past than you are with the future. So how do you teach people to believe in a future that they can't see or experience with their senses yet, but they've thought about enough times in their mind that their brain is literally a flower that, that takes time to bloom, trading the resentment, the frustration or the impatience for gratitude, appreciation and thankfulness, and you keep at it, there'll come a moment where that system switches on and now you're feeling grateful for no reason at all. In four days, we now know that you can change your genetic destiny if you just practice the inner work. See people with stage four cancer, with Parkinson's disease, with myasthenia gravis, with... There's two times the door to the subconscious mind opens up. I mean, when we wake up in the morning, mm -hmm and we go to bed at night. Right. Why? In because, that crossover place. Because your brain goes yeah. from deep delta brain waves to theta brain waves mm -hmm. to alpha brain waves to beta brain waves. And when you go to bed at night, it goes from beta to alpha to theta to delta. And if you can't get there, you're stuck in high beta, it's because you're driving the sports car in first gear, right? So people do whatever they can to get down there. So. The brain chemistry works in accordance with this. So when you wake up in the morning and the, and the receptors in the back of your eye pick up light, the moment that happens, your, your optic nerve sends a signal to the pineal gland and the pineal gland starts making serotonin. And serotonin is the daytime neurotransmitter. In other words, <clears throat> serotonin gets you up and going. It gets your brain turned on. The moment it starts getting dark at night and uh, your eye is no longer picking up visible light, the mechanism starts to change and now because there's less light, the, the optic nerve sends a signal to the, to, the, uh, to the pineal gland. The pineal gland takes serotonin and starts carving off a couple methyl groups and turns it into melatonin. And melatonin is the nighttime neurotransmitter. So Sarah gets you up in the morning and Mel puts you to bed at night. Now, <clears throat> when serotonin increases, your brainwave patterns go into beta. That's because you're going to pay attention more to the outer world. When you're in meditation and you close your eyes and you eliminate light and it's dark in the room and you play uh, music in the background, you put earplugs in, you're getting less sensory data coming mm -hmm. in from your environment so the neocortex is not so preoccupied with trying to create meaning between the outer world and the inner world. You're forgetting about the outer world and the inner world is where you're cultivating something. So then when you close your eyes and do your meditation, then your brain waves move into melatonin. But if you're waking up in the morning and you're waking up at five in the morning, guess what? your brain waves will probably be in theta or alpha. That's, you're in your subconscious. You're right. past the beta thinking, right? We go to bed at night, I have friends that are artists and playwrights and musicians. They stay up till two in the morning. They love that 11 o'clock till two in the morning. They're nighttime, they're in alpha. They got all these creative ideas. Mm -hmm. There's, you know, me, I'm a morning person. I wake up, I'm up at 4.30 or five in the morning. It's my time to create. I set aside a certain amount of time. That's my time because the rest of the day I'm serving. So I like to get myself right in the morning, right? So doing that then begins to alter brainwave patterns. Now, if you move from beta to alpha, there'll come an amazing moment where if you do this right, you'll slip into theta. Now, theta is when your body is asleep, but your mind is awake. Yes. So think about this. <clears throat> if your body's asleep and you've conditioned it to be the mind through addictions or habits, the moment the body's asleep, it's no longer the mind. So there's no longer any resistance. And that's where instantaneous change takes place. Well, I think the biggest lie we've been ever told is that we're linear beings living a linear life. Yes. I just, the moment Couldn't I had my first couple of these experiences, 
I know we are dimensional beings living a very dimensional experience of reality. And all of this indoctrination is to keep us from that because once the game is up, you can't ever go back to being the same person. So <clears throat> this reality, this dimension that we live in is called space-time. Space is eternal. There's the, the space is the field. And you and I experience time by moving through space. So if I'm going to go here to the door, I have to get up and walk through space. And when I walk through space, I'm going to experience time. I have an interview later on today. I know it's going to happen because I'm going to linearly walk through time, uh, space to experience that time. So in this dimension, we could say that space is the field and time is the river. And so we move, we experience time as we move through space. Got it? Mm -hmm. In the inverse reality, it's actually opposite. <laughs> In other words, time is everywhere. There's, time goes on forever. Mm -hmm. And you experience space when you move through time. You see how I can say it another way. So if time is the field and space is the river, then all of space is, is enfolded in time. So when you change your speed in this dimension, if we go fast from here to the door, the faster we move, the less time it takes, right? So we can, we can change time by moving through speed. Well, in this dimension where everything is vibration and electromagnetism, the faster your vibration is, the speed, the different levels of space you experience. So all of space is stacked on top of each other here. It's all happening in now because time is everywhere. There is no time. Mm -hmm. So everything's happening in this moment. And so different levels of consciousness and different levels of energy allow us to experience these different levels of space. So the you that's in the Egyptian period and the you that's in the future is all li lined up simultaneously. And when you start slipping through these dimensions, you live, and when I say live, I'm saying that it is real as this. And yeah, you okay. know who you are. Yes. And the person that you're married to or the person that you work with or your best friend is wearing a different face. And you understand your agreement that you negotiated yes. in all of those other places. So you have a few of those experiences and you start to no longer care about your checking account, the car you drive, what you look like, because you realize that you look like somebody else in another place. And some of the issues and some of the challenges that you have in this life, you're experiencing in that exact same life. And the choices you make here affect the choices that are happening there. And we could say that there's only past lives and future lives in this dimension, in, in space-time. In that dimension, there is no past lives. It's all happening now. I don't know how else to say it, but as you begin to change your consciousness, you can slip into different spaces, different realities, and experience aspects of yourself that are just like this wonderful kaleidoscope of possibilities. what it takes to truly change. Is there a formula that you can demystify the process? That most people, they wait for crisis or trauma or disease or diagnosis or loss. When they reach their lowest denominator, they finally make up their mind to change. And my message is why wait? That we can learn and change in a state of pain and suffering or we can learn and change in a state of joy and inspiration. And we are literally in a new, uh, a new era right now. And this era is about information. And in an age of information, ignorance is a choice. We don't need a doctor, a teacher, a governor, a priest, a rabbi, a minister to gain information any longer. Because we have access to information, people are taking their power back. Technology affords us the ability to research anything we want to research. And every time you learn something new, you make new synaptic connections in your brain. In fact, learning is making new connections. 
And the Nobel Prize laureate Kandel in the year 2000 found that when people learn just one bit of information and they concentrated on it for an hour, they doubled the number of connections in their brain from 1,300 connections to 2,600 connections. But if they didn't review that information, if they didn't think about it, if they didn't repeat it over and over in their mind, those connections pruned apart within hours or days. So if learning is making new synaptic connections, then remembering is maintaining and sustaining those connections, keeping those connections in a long-term relationship. And this is an opportunity for you to gain information, to retreat from your lives, and to break from the routine, mundane way that you do things long enough for you to begin to learn new information. And that information then begins to become installed in the circuitry in your brain. The question is, though, what do you do with that information? That if you can then take that information and apply it, personalize it, demonstrate it, initiate it in some way, if you can get your behaviors to match your intentions, if you can get your actions equal to your thoughts, if you can get your mind and body working together, you're going to have a new experience. An experience then enriches the philosophical circuits in the brain, laying down networks of neurons. And the moment those neurons string into place, the brain makes a chemical. And that chemical is called a feeling or an emotion. And the moment you feel like a leader, the moment you feel more unlimited, the more you feel gratitude from some experience, now you're teaching your body chemically to understand what your mind is intellectually understood. And we can say that knowledge is for the mind and experience is for the body. And in that moment, you are embodying the truth of that philosophy. And for one moment, your mind and body are aligned to a new destiny. And it is the environment and the interaction in the environment that actually changes genes. And we've measured this. That in four days, people can change their genetic expression if they begin to think differently, make new choices, do different things, create new experiences, create new feelings. They will change their genetic destiny. So then, in that moment, then, if you've done it once, or if you're training somebody to modify their behaviors, and they're able to do it once, then they should be able to do it again, yes or no? And if you can repeat an experience over and over again, over and over again, you will begin to neurochemically condition the mind and body to begin to work as one. And when you've done something so many times that your body now knows how to do it as well as your mind, now it's innate in you. It's second nature. It's easy. It's familiar. It's automatic. You're beginning to master that philosophy. And so we have studied brains in change. We've done over 8,500 brain scans, and we now know there's a formula that you can teach people to change. We work with CEOs and uh, companies all over the world, from Coca-Cola to Google to uh, Sony to Cisco to Pfizer, in an interest to work with upper management to teach them a model of change. And when you change individuals, you can change a culture. So then, my interest then is to not only measure just the brain, but we also know that it, it requires two ingredients for a person to begin to make a significant change. Number one is a clear intention, a vision, an idea of the future. And when a person begins to select a new idea in the future, if they can begin to emotionally embrace what that future is going to feel like, because they're so caught up in their inner vision, they begin to feel an elevated emotion. An emotion like gratitude, an emotion like inspiration, an emotion like motivation. And you can actually measure what happens to the heart when this occurs. So then when a person starts feeling the emotions of their future, in that instant, their heart begins to respond very differently. And we've measured this. The heart begins to become more coherent. It starts to beat in a more rhythmic pattern. And that by living by the emotions of fear and resentment and frustration and impatience actually causes the heart to beat out of rhythm. And people spend 70% of their time of their lives living by those stress hormones. Living in stress is living in survival. So the fundamental question is, can you teach people then how to create a more coherent brain? And can you teach them how to regulate their heart and be able to control how their heart responds? And our research shows that that's absolutely possible. And you don't have to be a Buddhist monk. 
You don't have to be a nun with 40 years of devotion. You don't have to be a minister, a scholar, an academic, that common people can learn how to do this. The side effect of this is that they begin to produce change in their immune system, changes in their gene expression, diseases go into remission. <clears throat> we start to see people having very transcendental moments that begin to redefine who they are. So then a clear intention and elevated emotion allows the person then to begin to see a new possibility. The question is then, can they sustain that state? Now, your brain is organized to reflect everything you know in your life. Your brain is a record of the past. It's an artifact of everything you've learned and experienced to this moment. So most people wake up in the morning and the first thing they do is they start to think about their problems. And those problems are memories that are etched in their brain. And those memories are connected to certain people, at certain places, with certain things at certain times. And the moment they begin to think about their problems, we could say that they're thinking in the past. Now, every single one of those problems has an emotion associated with them. So then the moment they think about a problem, the brain turns on circuits that are connected to the past, and then all of a sudden they start feeling unhappy. They start feeling unworthy. They start feeling fear or anxiety. Now, thoughts are the language of the brain, and feelings are the language of the body. And how you think and how you feel creates your state of being. So most people start their day from a state of being that's completely derived from the familiar past. And when people live in the familiar past, they will create a predictable future. And then they get up and they do a series of routine automatic behaviors. They, they stretch, then they grab their cell phone, they check their WhatsApp, they check their text, they check their email, they check their Facebook, they take a picture of their feet, they post it on Facebook, then they tweet, then they Twitter, then they check the news, and then all of a sudden now they're connected to everything known in their lives. And then all of a sudden they go through that same routine behavior. From waking up, getting a cup of coffee, taking a shower, driving to work, and they're in a program. And then we could say then their body is dragging them into a predictable future based on what they did in the past. And 95% of who we are by the time we're 35 years old is a set of memorized behaviors, emotional reactions, unconscious beliefs and perceptions, hardwired attitudes that function just like a computer program. The person has a thought or a reaction to something in their environment and then they go unconscious. And so people in the midst of change are trying to use 5% of their conscious mind to work against 95% of what they've memorized subconsciously because they've been doing it for 10 or 20 years and their body is on autopilot. And we can say then that person has lost their free will to a program and they're headed for a genetic destiny. So if we're not defined by a vision of the future, then we could say then, for the most part, we are living by the memories of the past. <laughs> and we could say then, a person who's in the state believes in their past more than they believe in their future. Remember, you have receptors. Your eyes are receptors. Your ears are receptors, like a cell. Your nose is a receptor. Your tongue is a receptor. Your whole surface of your body is receptors that's picking up information. And normally, the information we pick up is based on light and matter. Are you with me still? Light bouncing off things and creating images for us to perceive. When energy finally makes it to the fourth center, I, I just was on the phone with the researchers from HeartMath Institute on the drive over here. They were so sweet. They called me to thank me for all the great work that we have done as a community. And we had this conversation about the benefits of what could happen when energy finally makes it to the heart. And every time it makes it to the heart, some of it, majority of it, continues all the way up to the brain because the heart is an amplifier once it's activated 
to activate the brain. Are you with me still? Now, if you were to take away all my other systems, my musculoskeletal system, my lymphatic system, <clears throat> my digestive system, my skin system, integumentary system, and just left my nervous system, I would look like a cotton candy man called Joe Dispenza. Are you with me still? And you have these big trunks of nerves that come out that go to your limbs, at, the, at your neck, and down your legs. And as energy moves up, it's passing through each one of those spinal nerves. Yes or no? And when, as, it, as it moves up and it enters the fifth center, it's going to go right down your hands. And you are going to feel energy coming out of your hands. You're going to feel this when we do the healing and your body is getting ready to heal someone. Because the more love you feel, the more you can give energy. And these are the things we use to give with and to do with. Are you with me still? So then once energy makes it here, so many people have said, oh, my head kind of locks back and oh, I feel this kind of intense pleasure in my chest. And then I feel this electricity coming out of my hands. And people with spinal cord injuries to the neck, and people with disc herniations in their neck, people with uh, whiplash and all kinds of injuries or severed nerves, it's happened where that energy reconstructs neurological tissue because the faster frequency is being facilitated through the nervous system because they're at a greater level of consciousness. And don't you know every time you tune into that energy and become conscious of that energy, your nervous system is beginning to facilitate a greater frequency because that's where your attention is. And if you connect with it and stay present with it and surrender to it and experience it, it's going to naturally move. Are you with me still? Come on. So then, as this center becomes active, your sensory receptors, check it out, are not picking up material things with your pressure and two-point discrimination and temperature. It's picking up an electrical current. It's picking up a frequency that your hand is actually emitting and you're paying attention to it, and it's something unknown or unusual. Yes or no? And if you can stay present with it and experience it, the experience is changing your brain so you can perceive more of it the next time it happens. Are you with me still? And so when it comes time to heal, and this center is open, the center of oneness, the center of wholeness, and you can get beyond yourself and connect to that unified field, and open your heart and put your attention behind your hands or beyond your hands, if you actually have already been feeling that energy, the moment you put your attention on it, it's going to amplify even more because what you put your attention on expands. You put your attention on your pain, it gets bigger. Take your attention off it, it goes away. You put your attention on the field, it expands. You take your attention off it, it goes away. Your attention brings things to life. Would you agree? So now imagine a person who's having a change in their energy and their heart is opening and once their heart opens and they feel it and they feel the physical change because oxytocin is signaling nitric oxide and you're, all, these, all these chemicals are expanding the arteries in your heart and lungs, you're actually feeling something like your heart is full. And then when you feel your heart full, what do you do next? You pay attention to that feeling and it causes it to swell even more. And if those emotions then tend to drive thoughts equal to your emotional state, or better said, the frequency of this center can carry the thoughts of a more unlimited mind, a giver, someone who's more selfless, who's in more in the present moment, then the side effect of that is that you should be able to do the uncommon and the supernatural because your body is responding to your mind. How many people understand? Great question. You're doing the work correctly.